Um, Miss George? Yes. Mr. Montoya? Present. Ms. Haskey? Madam President Aspas? And I am present, and then we have a quorum. We'll go to item two, student, staff, and community recognition. A, Teacher Appreciation Week. Is there someone presenting? Ms. Chappelle asked to add the Teacher Appreciation Week on the agenda if any board members would like to say something. Well, as secretary of the board, I would like to extend appreciation to all of the teachers for all of their sacrifice and their hard work. <clears throat> I don't have any flowers to pass out. <laughs> but my uh, my congratulations to them all and an appreciation to them all. Any other board members care to comment? Absolutely. Go ahead. I was fortunate enough to go to, um, to the schools in Shiprock with the uh, superintendent to thank uh, I, I believe it was the vast majority of them in person. And I truly appreciate everything that they do, uh, especially over the past couple of years in dealing with COVID. And now that um, we seem to be, uh, at least at this point in time, knock on wood, um, clear, but obviously proceeding cautiously and them uh, being committed to our students and educating them. For that, I am truly grateful for everything that they do. So I thank them very much. Ms. George, is there something you would like to say? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, just appreciation to all our teachers. Um, thank you for teaching our little ones, the babies, all the way up to high school. And you're almost done. Hang in there. And um, we couldn't ask for better dedicated teachers to be in our district and working with our kids and our um, our um, students with disabilities. And um, I just thank you for all your hard work coming in early in the morning and staying late, late, late until seven or eight at night, grading papers and whatnot and going on field trips and going to your PLC meetings and your um, leadership meetings and um, your cultural meetings. So thank you so much for all that you do. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on then to um, item three, comments from the audience. Sharon, do we have any comments? We have no comments at this time. All right. We'll move on to item four reports and it says here that we'll give reports three minutes apiece um, let's see the first one is by uh vanessa hurley hello um my students have a really quick presentation uh, we're requesting approval for our national leadership conference. So I will hand it over to our <clears throat> president. 
Okay, so this is KCHS FCCLA National Competition, July 2nd through the 7th in Denver, Colorado. So what is FCCLA? FCCLA stands for Career Family, Career, Community Leaders of America, a connection between family and community, learning skills that are useful in everyday life throughout high school and post high school, and it gives students a chance to take action into the next steps into their career. Uh, skills gained from being an FCCLA include career and college readiness, 90-day plan, interpersonal communication skills, and worldly experience. So my project is career investigation. Um, why? Before doing this project, I had no idea what I wanted to do after high school. This project has helped me set goals for pursuing my career. By going to nationals, I also want to be able to represent my culture. Uh, skills learned, responsibility and time management, communication and public speaking, and self-confidence. Um, hello, my name is Hope Chapman, yes. and um, um, the skills I learned from being FCCLA is public speaking, memorization skills, planning skills, and commitment skills. Why I chose to do the project I did with my partner was to help better our community and to inform people, more people about the dangers plastic, paper, and aluminum have uh, and how they affect the climate change. And we noticed that there wasn't any recycling at our school. Hi, my name is Michelle Henderson. And some skills that I learned from doing this project is public speaking skills, organization skills, memorization skills, and planning skills. Why I wanted to do this project is to help inform others about the environment, and I wanted to be a part of the reason why the planet is still here. I wanted to help others learn about how plastic, paper, and aluminum has dangerous effects on Earth. So, our, our project was about sustainability, and uh, we noticed that the students of our school were littering around the campus, and it made our school look bad. So I wanted to help build a recycling program, which we, had, we hadn't had before at our school. Um, some skills we learned from this project together are talking to our community of Kirtland Central High School and uh, researching information online about the different damages plastic, paper, and aluminum have on our planet. And we also learned time management skills. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay, go ahead. Um, hello, my name is Mad my name is Madison Medley, and my project was the plastic bag mat. Uh, why I wanted to do this project was we wanted to help with the homeless comfortability that are in Kirtland. We also wanted to raise awareness for plastic bag uh, pollution and contribute to our community. Yeah. This is actually one of the mats that we made. Um, this okay. is one that we had just actually finished. Okay. okay. Um, the skills we learned during our project were how to work as a big group, considering we are a pretty big chapter. We also learned how to help the community. Uh, we also, most of us learned about leadership skills. We also learned a lot of problem solving skills with this project. And we also learned how to communicate as a team. Hello, my name is Lacey Mitchell. And some skills I've learned is communication skills, leadership skills, organization skills, and time management skills, and how to be a leader. Why I did this project was to connect with our community to, and to improve the literacy rights in our state to teach kids that reading is fun and can be more, can be a big part of their life and future. So I learned skills that I need in the future and jobs. Uh, hello, my name is Madison Aparicio. The skills I learned was time management, social skills, leadership skills, and communication skills. Why I did this project was to bond and to get to new, know the, the new generation, increase my social skills, have, having kids to read more because our reading levels for high school are very low. Showing kids reading can be more fun than, can be more than just reading on the, words on the paper. Okay, go. Our project was focused on children. Why we did this project was to implement the idea that reading can be fun. We also wanted to improve our literacy rates in our school and state because a lot of high, schoolers, high school students are reading at a third grade level. The skills we learned is we learned organizational skills as well as social skills. We learned how to set proper goals and how to how to form a plan. We learned how to be a leader. Hi, I'm Omari Garcia, 
And aside from what was all mentioned from the skills they learned, what I personally learned was leadership skills, professionalism, communication skills, presentation skills, and critical thinking skills. So my personal project was um, professional presenta presentation team. And the topic we chose to talk about was community college. And for the purpose of why we did this project was I wanted to help give back to my community and discuss why college is so important to show others that there are opportunities available after high school and to increase my presentation and communication skills that are needed for the future. Hi, uh, my name is Justin Harrison. And our, we did, me and Amari did the professional presentation. So the skills that we learned was the technology ability and how to create a presentation along with the memorization, along with um, being prepared and written and delivered a speech and the ability to pop public to people. So what we wanted to do, why we wanted to do this project was to give back to our community by putting together a multimedia presentation on how everyone has an option to pursue higher education and boost both of our capacity of public speaking and our capacity for communication with others by providing us with the tools to create multimedia presentation. So our topic on professional presentation, presentation was how post-secondary um, post-secondary education can be considered as a community college. Okay, yeah. So as here is shown are some of the uh, skills that are needed in our presentation. So as you say, we did put it together a multimedia presentation where we did present in front of judges. And so when presenting, we must learn how to um, work with each other so that we can make connections and show our different points of views. And so why we did it was, as I mentioned before, we do want to give back to our community here in Kirtland and to let others know that there is opportunities for higher education. And we want to inform the kids about community college as an option after high school. Okay, so click, go ahead and click again. All right, um, so now the kids are going to discuss the fundraising that we will be doing between now and, um, go ahead. Charity. So some fundraising ideas we have is, well, I'll start, first start off with this, cookies and canvases. So we want to hold um, a night where, well, an evening where we would bake cookies for people who want to participate. And we would also um, uh, paint, canvases. paint canvases, like for people who want to paint. And we would just provide everything that would be. And we want to hold this um, sometime during this school year. And then the meals and the Navajo tacos. And with um, including the meals like Navajo tacos or like Frito pies, um, for example. And for this one, we want to raise um, or we want to fundraise a dinner. Um, uh, this would be held at our school. And that, that's it. <laughs> That's the end of our presentation. The kids have worked really hard. Um, we do have some fundraising ideas uh, that we will carry out. Um, the trip is going to cost quite a bit of money. We have missed the early bird registration um, from being pushed, from not getting on the board agenda. So um, it is going to be quite expensive, um, but these kids have worked really hard and placed gold Okay. Any thoughts from the board? Yes, I have a question. Go ahead. Miss Hurley? Yes. So what percentage are you trying to raise through the fundraising efforts? Um, so we are hoping to get at least three, three thousand, four thousand um in fundraising. And then with the consideration of the, the board or the district providing the, the difference? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, my question is regards to the timing, July 2nd through the 7th. And at this point in time, and um, we haven't received or approved the budget. So I don't know how much that's going to impact it. Um, is the superintendent on? Or, or his designee. 
I'm going to go with my Desi B probably though. Okay. That's what are you on there? Just because I'm in and out and I don't know how well you can hear me. Yes, I'm here. I believe that's Mr. Jesswood. Yep. Are you able to answer that question? Uh, can you restate the question? Sorry. The timing. Um, Ms. Hurley has stated that trying to raise between three and four thousand dollars. And obviously the difference would be either 16 or 17,000 would have to be approved by the board. And uh, my concern is just the timing. We haven't seen a budget yet. Uh, the budget hasn't been approved. So that's a little bit of apprehension on, on my part. And I don't know how that would work, technically speaking. Um, by approving this and then not having a budget to to actually look at or work with or work that into to be able to provide that funding. That's really kind of where my question is and concern is. Okay. So from what it's sounding like, um, so travel for May and June has been limited to close out for this uh, current uh, year. So from what it sounded like uh, from the finance department, that we should have we should be able to get uh, travel back up uh, once uh, budgets are approved. Uh, so once uh, January or July 1st uh, comes around, uh, these trips should be okay to be approved. So that would mean that we would need to, if that the difference of the 16,000 is not, uh, if, if the board needs to approve the 16,000, then in the June board meeting, we can probably uh, re approve that difference of whatever is not raised. So, um, Ms. Hurley, you understand my, my questioning, yes. correct? So we missed the early bird registration. I put my paperwork in in March, March 7th. Um, but okay. it was, I don't know if there was a communication error or what would happen, but we were overlooked. And so um, the price has gone up uh, because okay. we did miss that early bird registration. And so with us coming up with the extra three to 4,000, it's still going to be 20,000 from the school. Okay, so the district would be paying the difference or, or the 20,000 then you guys would pay the difference in respects to the um, registration fee, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so again, you understand my apprehension at this point in time. Oh, absolutely, um, yes. Because, and, and like I uh, said, we submit our paperwork um, in ample time. It's just, I'm not quite sure where the miscommunication yeah, was. I, I truly respect that. Um, but again, this is one of those situations where we're talking about uh, quite a bit of money and making a decision beforehand um, before we even know what we have in front of us. Absolutely. Um, so I, I, again, that's, that's my concern at this point in time. I just don't want to get ahead of ourselves. As much I would love to do this um, right now, again, it's just we don't have anything in front of us to say absolutely yes, um, because uh, as you've heard in the past, I'm a very big supporter of what the students do, especially in regards to leadership. Uh, I support that 100%, but this is one of those budgetary issues where we have to make sure we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's, not Last once, but this, twice, but three times. Last year, when attended um when they attended the national event last year they were the only navajo students at the event um so they were a big represent representation of the navajo nation um and so that was that was pretty cool for them to experience that but we definitely understand your apprehension and we appreciate your time no again i'm i'm in full support but it's just like i said technically we don't have any true hard dollar number in front of us to say absolutely um and, until i have that i i won't be comfortable until i've seen that and we've approved that budget again i, I want you guys to go but we need to make sure as a board we have that in front of us thank you thank you miss george any comments oh uh, yeah my only um the only concern that i have is that the Utilization of funds opens up J July 1st. And so I don't know how, uh, Mr. Deswood, how we would pay for the room and the buses because the buses need at least two weeks notice. And 
um, all of that um, on the first for them to leave on the second. And then, of course, um, following what Mr. Montoya stated as well. Right. So as long as we have a purchase order uh, in place, uh, requisitions in place, uh, we should we should be OK once that uh, budget for the new year is approved by the board. Mm. And accepted by the by the state. Okay. So the other the other question, um, Mr. Secretary, uh, if I may. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Deswood, uh, in regards to the um, Bank of America, um, you know, ensuring that we have adequate funds. Uh, and then again, I know there's also, as we wind down at the end of the year, there's um, certain stipulations with the use of that card and then a mad dash to <clears throat> utilize that card. So that's also, again, um, something that we have to take into consideration as well. It's just, again, I, I don't like saying what I have to say, but again, technically, we don't need to get ourselves in trouble with the uh, state of Mexico when it comes to our um, finances and our budget. So um, certainly if there was some way of trying to be able to mitigate that, that would uh, hopefully by next month's meeting, we, we can have a clear picture on what we can do and how we can do it with the budget in front of us and approved. If there isn't any other comments, next item. Unique trip request. Bond Wilson Technical Center Skills USA National Leadership and Skills Conference, Atlanta, Georgia. Mr. Garola. Good evening, board. Uh, thank you for having me. And so uh, I'm back again. Um, I presented for the state competition and we were wildly successful at the state competition uh, last month. And we had some uh, qualifiers. And so this year, Skills USA um, is being held in Atlanta, Georgia. It was held there last year as well. We sent um, a group of students to Atlanta last year. Um, this year, it's June 19th through the 23rd um, for the National Leadership and Skills Conference. Um, and so I've, I've been fortunate enough to be a part of Skills USA Nationals, taking students to nationals. And I can tell you what a phenomenal event it is there because, you know, so many, so many, um, well, it's, it involves 108 different trades and technical and leadership fields. And there's like 10,000 kids from all over the country that converge on this event. It's a huge event. Um, there's there's uh, thousands of vendors there representing all the different trades and, and, and industries. And um, they keep the kids busy all day with leadership and leadership uh, um, classes and, and um, their actual competitions. And um, so, like I said, I've, I've, been fortunate enough to be a part of this um, this conference uh, in the past, and we, uh, like I said, we took a group of students last year as well. But I don't know from listening to the to the last um, item, um, I don't know if we're going to run into the same problem. So they they did the same thing last year. They qualified last year, um, and so uh, like I said, I don't know if we're going to end up with the same kind of um, budget uh, issues. Because this trip is going to cost about fifteen, little over fifteen thousand dollars total for, for the event, um, and so I, I, uh, 
we've had we had five five students qualify. Um, uh, Quade Stilago in carpentry took first place. He's a he's a two time state champion, so that was pretty awesome. And then uh, Jarrett Guillory took first place uh, or the gold medal in welding. Um, and then uh, Tanya Manuelito, Gabrina Gab- Gabrina Begay, and Michaela Jim took the gold medal in the Career Pathways uh, show- Showcase. So those five students will represent our district um, in Atlanta. Um, and so I, I think, yeah, they, it looks like they have like a little condensed agenda that was was released. They don't have the full agenda out just yet. That's that's all that we had at this point. Um, but like I said, it's just a, it's just a cool um, multiple day event where they keep the kids going and they meet people, they network, um, and then they get to show off show off their their skills and compete against uh, the best of the nation. Um, and like I said, we've we've been really fortunate to represent um, Bond Wilson. You know, we're not we're not a huge huge team, but um, you know, as they say, the proof is in the pudding when. You know, we took first and second place in 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 construction. We took the gold medal in in uh, welding, um, and then the career pathway showcase for health services. Um, they also took the gold. We also took the bronze medal in um, bacon and pastry arts with culinary, which is really cool. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like I said, we were very well represented. But like I said, I I'm now kind of concerned that. Uh, we might run into some budgetary issues. And I don't know how it was financed last year. It was kind of the same deal. They qualified for for nationals. And then I don't know, to be honest, I don't know where all the the funding came from or what was approved um, to make that trip happen. Because it was kind of the same deal. They qualified at state and then it was a quick turnaround to to prepare to send students to nationals. And that's always the kind of the hard thing too, right? Like you don't know how many kids or who's going to qualify for nationals, if any are going to qualify for nationals. So it's kind of a hard event to plan for. Any thoughts from the board? Comment. Go ahead, Mr. Montoya. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Garola, I mean, obviously you've heard the prior conversation. Um, yes, sir. You know, at this point, uh, with the consideration of things and the budget winding down, the expenditures and uh, those types of things, unless uh, the finance department, uh, the superintendent, and those that are involved can figure some way of um, ensuring that we could do this, Mm-hmm. Um, then just as with the first, I mean, I don't, like I said, I don't like denying anybody an opportunity, especially when you're talking about the leadership opportunities or expanding their knowledge and their learning. I, I'm all for that. Um, just right now it's, and it's not that we don't have the funding, it's the end of the, 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 the school year and the closing of a lot of those budgets and again, especially with when we're talking about that Bank of America card and trying to utilize that and how we utilize that, I'm sure um, Mr. Deswood, yeah, he's got his hand up. He can explain that a little bit more. So if you would, Mr. Deswood, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, board members and uh, principals, Mr. Carlson, if you're still on. Uh, thank you. Uh, so really quickly, I did check with Donovan. Uh, Donovan said that uh, w- even for the previous trip that we can create a purchase order on this year's budget. But once uh, J- July comes around for the new year, the new uh, fiscal year of 24, then we can um, put a new a new uh, purchase order uh, in place and then it'll be charged to budget year 24. Uh, so even, even Mr. Gorola's, there's a way we can do it. And I've been updating uh, Mr. Carlson and um, uh, Mr. Switch as far as uh, for activities. And just for this for this week and next week, we've been limiting the use of that Bank of America card. And um, as of this morning, um, there was about ninety two thousand um, uh, credit line available. Uh, so I've been updating uh, Mr. Carlson, like I said, Mr. Switch, uh, in the morning and then in the evening for you know as far as where we're at. So 
definitely um, Donovan just updated me again that we ended up getting a a 500k uh, increase uh, on, on that corporate card. So um, we should be able to uh, get the funds and the purchase orders in place for both of those trips, uh, uh, board chair and board members. Awesome news. Okay, yeah, and and again, that's obviously where I was going with this. If there's a way to try to be able to do that, and you know, when we go through these uh, requests, um, detailing the the student um, travel pre approval form, that making sure everything is in place, making sure the signatures uh, lines are signed by the right people. Uh, because again, those, as we've been told before, and we know and understand that these get archived, they're, they're part of the audit when it comes to audit time and ensuring that, uh, again, not to be redundant, but dotting our I's and crossing our T's two or three times that we're square on everything that we're doing. So, you know, if there's some way that we can do that and assist, uh, said it before and i'm gonna say it again i'm all for these our students uh expanding their knowledge their learning their leadership skills and um helping that opportunity to be provided to them so just please keep us in touch and again this evening it's just the reports there's obviously there's no action that doesn't happen till tuesday and then when we come back uh, i'm sure we can get some more concrete responses and answers to the situation so I appreciate it, Mr. Deswood. Thank you. Ms. George. Any further comment, Ms. George? Oh, I had sorry, I had it on mute. <laughs> um, no, I don't have any um, comments after uh, Mr. Deswood uh, gave his um, his portion of information. Thank you. Okay. I have a comment, Secretary Wells. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, the, the, the talks, I, I, I heard some of the discussion coming down and the talks about the um, the card, um, Bank of America card, and and that um, those are two big um, two different issues, and so I'm 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 concerned and confused. And the way that discussion has been going, um, I realized that um, we had students in Albuquerque and their card was declined. So are we having a, a card issue or are we having money issues? Um, Mr. Carlson, Superintendent Carlson. Sorry about that. It took me a while to mute. I did hear that. So I think that we should probably limit discussion about that. We don't have a money problem. Um, we have had some issues with credit limits. Um, right now, we are no longer going to have those issues. And we've done the necessary steps to make sure that we're okay. So, it's, so all we need to worry about in this case is funding. And, and I agree with those folks who said that we should, we should do our best to make these trips happen. Okay, thank you. Madam President, do you wish to take charge then? Yeah, I'll go ahead since you're going to be leaving. Uh, so we're at item B. Yes. And any more comments, questions, board members? Yeah. We'll go ahead and go on to item C. 
unique trip requests, SHS Girls Basketball, Basketball Tournament, Glendale, Arizona, June 14th through the 17th, 2023 by Robert McCaskill, who's in person. Thank you. <laughs> um, board, uh, my name is Robert McCaskill. I'm the head coach of the Shiprock Lady Chieftains. I would like to take the team to Glendale, Arizona for a team camp. It's a very selective team camp. Um, there will be hundreds hundreds of coaches, college coaches uh, at this camp. And I would like our girls to get um, looked at at an early age, uh, just in case if they have any aspirations of playing college basketball. Any questions, board members, comments? Questions? Go ahead. Uh, so the timing shows June 14th, which is obviously outside of the uh, time frame of school uh, is that something that is applicable to the to the district or something that we need to approve is it something that the um, the team is going to be utilizing district equipment district travel uh, sponsored by the district in any shape form or fashion monetarily um, that's that's my question is it something that's um, under our purview because of the timing. Yes. Thank you. Yes, um, it will be district um, funded. Um, I have the money in my budget to um, take the bus and pay for the hotels and meals. Any other questions, comments, board members? I have a question. Go ahead. So is this the team? Is this like your whole varsity team or just your all your seniors? Because you said there's college scouts out there, or is this just a selected, a selected number of girls going? It is not selected. I open it up to all of the players and it is in it's on their schedule. If they cannot make it, they you know they won't make it. But whoever wants to come. I'm um, taking the first 15, and I've had 10 that signed up already, so it is, um, um, that's how many I have. I open it up to everyone. I got another question, Madam President. Go ahead. Um, does this count against their uh, regular season game participation? Do I answer it? No, no, it doesn't. Okay, thank you. I have a question, yes, and, and it, it's somewhat to Mr. Montoya's question, um, where it doesn't count against them or are for them playing the regular season, high school season, but what about uh, college? No. No. Um... Summer is uh, open, and the state of Mexico is open, so it doesn't count against uh, anything in the regular season. It does not count against anything for their uh, colleges. It doesn't violate any um, uh, recruiting uh, regulations. That's why college coaches are sitting there standing and they watch this one big group and they see all the girls play. So it doesn't it doesn't violate any rules whatsoever. Okay. Any other questions, comments, board members? I think he's answered my question. Oh, I do have one question. Your chaperone or me? Yes. Oh, go ahead. Your chaperones are they this? Are they with the school or yes, okay. staff? Okay. Good. Okay. With background checks. Yes, staff. Okay. Coaching staff. Okay. And we're absolutely sure. Yes. Yes, we're learning my lesson the first time. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And we'll go on to item D, fundraising requests, KCHS Baseball, Fan Cloth Fundraiser, May 17, 2023, May 28, 2023, by Isaiah Valdez. Go ahead. Uh, this is Rebecca. Um, I, he was supposed to be on. I don't, I'm not sure where he is. I can text him. Um, I really can't um, address this um, comfortably. Do you want me to try and get hold of him? No. Um, yes, get a hold of him and then we can squeeze him in. Okay, I'll call him. Thank it, you. And, and, and I hope he doesn't expect... Um, he had a time slot here, but if we have to save him to the very end, we'll do that. Okay, I'll call him now. <clears throat> okay, we'll go on to item E, update on J-1 visa by Peter Deswitt. Good evening, uh, board members, uh, staff. So he, he, here's the updates on the V situation, uh, the H, H1B. Uh, again, it's, a, it's two three-year terms, uh, can lead to permanent residency. Also, the J1 is a three-year term and can be extended for two more years. Uh, visitor exchange, so older must return home for two years and does not lead to permanent residency. So where we are currently with the J-1 teachers, we have 25 with visas to expire on June 30, 2023. So we have one guidance counselor, one preschool, one kindergarten, two first grade, and one fourth grader. We have another uh, fifth grader, and these are all teachers, uh, four science teachers, one ELA, six math, uh, one family and consumer science teacher, one PE teacher, and five SPED teachers. Okay, so we have five with visas to expire on June 30th, 2024. And those are made up of one kindergarten, one first grade, one fourth grade teacher, and two special education teachers. Uh, we have five newly hired with visas to expire in June 30th, 2025, and then eligible for a two-year extension. These are, this comprises of one gifted, one math, and three special education teachers. Now, moving over to the, uh, our current H-1B teachers, uh, all prepared H-1B teachers uh, hired prior to the school year have reached green card status and 12 new visas allotted and budgeted. So 12 new hires in process. And then none of these teachers uh, have arrived yet. They are getting closer, but the process is very slow. Uh, we also have, um, there's, a, there's a, probably about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12 that are hired, and these ones are the ones that are currently being processed. So I stand for questions. Board? Any comments or questions, board members? None here. None. Okay. Um, there was uh, correspondence going back and forth from the um, senator's office to uh, Carlson. What in, has there been any new news? Superintendent Carlson? Yes, ma'am, I can answer that. Um, we were told, you and I, that we would hear by last Wednesday, and I have not heard, or actually it was yesterday, I'm sorry. I have not heard from them. 
so I can go ahead and, and reach out again tomorrow and say, listen, we haven't heard from you. Has there been any progress? But no, we had not heard. Okay. And and that's the update that I'm really looking for. Um, I was the one that asked for this. And um, but in the meantime, it could um I I believe it was our fault that this is occurring. And so we could be proactive in in um making sure it doesn't happen again. So but any updates, um, it would it would be appreciated. Thank you. Board President Aspis, just to respond to that, I absolutely will keep you in the loop. You're on the email thread, and I'll make sure that you're in any correspondence. Thank you. Any more comments, questions, board members? We'll go on to item F. Update on the Nahanza bus stop lights and Randy J. Manning sign by Candace Thompson. Sharon? Yes, for President Aspis. Do we have um, Candace Thompson on? Uh, yes, we do. She's on Zoom. Um, is sound okay? Uh, she's on mute right now. She has the next one also, so. Good evening, board president, members of the board. Go ahead. Um, item no, F. Yes, item F. Um, I will turn it over to Ms. Chappelle to give an update on the school bus light, and then I will give the board an update on the signage for the Randy J. Manning building. Good afternoon, um, school board president and board members uh, and attendees. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, so the update on the um, the uh, school bus light is that um, NTUC, I'm sorry, NTUA has agreed to have a meeting to um, finalize location. Um, and they have set that for the 22nd and um, once we have that meeting, we will be able to move forward on placing the light. Um, but they have indicated to me that they are agreeable to working with us to do that. Okay, um, the fixture? The, the fixture we have identified and Ms. Thompson, um, I think presented on that last time, it's a solar fixture. Uh, I believe the Nananazad chapter has put that into place and it's working well for them. Um, yes. And, yes. Okay. 
So we have made some incremental progress on that. And um, I can give you an update after the meeting on the 22nd, Board President. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Please make sure the rest of the board is included in that. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. And um, we'll go on to item. Well, any more, any comments, questions on this? We'll go on to item G. Candace is going to do the J Manning sign. Did you want me to give you an update okay. on that, board yeah. president? Okay. Yeah. Um, board Sorry. president, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Carlson, we are on the schedule for next week for the signage to be installed on the building. Um, they haven't given us, been able to give us a specific date as of this afternoon at three o'clock but they have assured us that we are on the schedule for next week. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, board president. Any questions, comments, board members? We'll go on to item G, CCSD property disposal request by Candace Thompson. Sharon, if you can um, open the list. So um, tonight we would like to present to the board um, equipment and property that um, is need of disposing items are outdated, unsafe, obsolete, or broken beyond repair. Um, Ms. Ray, if you can scroll down to the list. So um, the first item, we have a reach-in uh, refrigerator, a Hobart meat and cheese slicer, a Duke uh, chill serving table, a Canon printer, a Canon plotter, a Canon uh, camcorder, a live broadcast media cart. We have two of those. A teleconference conferencing equipment, two of those. Um, a laminator, again, another laminator, a paper shredder, uh, a color, an HP color printer, uh, a Delta Unisaw tilting arbor saw with table, a restroom cleaning machine, a pottery wheel, another uh, saw, tilting Unisaw, a disc sander belt, a jet floor oscillating spindle sander, a Rockwell DeWalt uh, Delta joiner, a 26 inch floor scrubber, a buffer by Windsor, advanced aqua clean floor cleaner, a restroom cleaning machine, a floor buffing machine, and um, a chariot Windsor scrubber, uh, several cafeteria tables, a Blodgett double stack oven, another double stacked oven, a double oven, a milk cooler, a beverage air milk cooler, a reach in milk cooler, a milk cooler two-sided, a true milk cooler dual-sided, a Victory Plymouth commercial refrigerator, a reach-in milk cooler, uh, uh, undercounter ice machine, another undercounter ice machine, a drill press, a Miller-Matic electric MIG welder, a Rockwell radial saw, a Chevy Silverado, a rigid sewer machine, 
a Dayton 16 inch floor drill press, a closing 20 inch drill press, an Everett wooden piano, a Heister 30 electric forklift, a Manitowoc ice machine, a Duke food warmer, a Delta bandsaw, a buffer chariot, a Powermatic planer, a true heat cabinet, two door, a time clock machine, an AED defibrillator. We have three of four of those. And then um, a stage right, eight piece stage set. Is there any questions or concerns about the items that are on the list? Any questions, board members? I have one present. Go ahead. Um, Ms. Ms. Candice, um, on those AEDs, um, have they tried to um, uh, give them back for um, uh, recalibrate? Yeah, recalibrate or um, uh, what do you call it? Like trade for the newer the newer ones. Um, I know you can do that. Um, I. I would have to defer. Let me give me one second. Because I think those three, those four are from the PE or from the gyms. Because those were under um, the. Um, they did, but they were um, defective. Mm. Okay. In what way? Yeah. Um, let me ask. Because those were done under athletics. Uh, let me let me reach out to uh, Christy Brown real quick and see what um, the defective item was on it that they were not able to trade those in. Uh, may I comment, Candace? Uh, please, please, board president. So I, I don't understand that they're good enough to um, take to auction, but they're defective here. And how is how does that make sense? Could we be held liable for auctioning off a defective yeah. equipment? Board, board president, sorry about that. My computer uh, just started doing an update. Um, I, I believe your question you had started with if they're defective. Um, why are we, why are we putting them on this list? Is that correct? Yes. Why? Why auction? Um, board president, I think this list is just a disposal list so that we can get these items off our inventory, and then um, I believe those those items would be uh, disposed of properly. But at the top, it says for auction um, in, in your paperwork. It doesn't say disposal. I believe it says disposal also in, in the, very, um, the very first paperwork. Yeah, the, the top part says disposal request, but then purposed method of disposition in its public auction. And then other is marked where it says scrap, recycle, and trade-in. Right. Scrap would be um, disposing of, of those items, board president. I'm being told that um, uh, I believe Ms. Sutherland had her hand up 
Amanda, um, can you confirm that there was a rebate provided on these? Yes, and what happened was is um, the company that did it, we used to be able to man, the gentleman would come from Albuquerque. It was way back when um, we had another person before uh, Ms. Brown and we um, waited and waited and finally we got the rebate, but then we, they never could come and get these. So then they allowed us to um, just follow our process. May I have president? Yes, go ahead. Um, Ms. Sutherland, so are these AEDs from the athletic areas? You know, I can't remember where they were from. We, um, you know, they come and they do the checks on them. And then they were, um, I want to say like a recall, but um, mm -hmm. they were supposed, so then we, you know, remember you could take them to Albuquerque and then trade them out. So um, that guy moved to Arizona and we never were able to get together and do that. And so um, they were like, just dispose of them because they didn't have anybody to come and pick them up anymore. And their person is now living in Arizona. So that's how that worked out. Mm, but well, we I replaced know all of them. So the the ones in the athletic areas, like the pit and and um, at Portland Central, the the pit there, they have the new AEDs. Then yes, every but every yep, we've updated everything. We've actually put um, others in different places, and the coaches and trainers. Um, the trainers actually, we ordered them um, traveling ones, so they didn't have to take them on and off the wall. So they have and their own. And mm -hmm. the buses have the AEDs? I'm not sure. Um, I can check. Yeah, because um, I know Zol, Zol, that Zol um, company, uh, regardless, will we'll take them back. But, um, you know, uh, I, I was just wondering, just to make sure. Yeah, there um, was just an issue. And then COVID, it was like in between all that. So we just, um, we got the rebate and then um, we're just going to dispose of them. Where, where is the defective? Is it, um, is it the AED device itself or is it the battery or? It was the, um, if I can remember, cause it was three years ago or so. It was the, um, just the component. I don't think it, I think it was the AED itself. And so we couldn't get a battery or it wasn't a battery issue. It was itself like a recall. You know how sometimes like your vehicle gets a recall or so those were in a, in a lot. Hmm. Um, board, board president, board member, uh, George, those items, we will um, not include those in our public auction, but we will be sure that those items are destroyed so that the district has no liability um, in those being placed on a public auction format. Um, Ms. Ray, if you can scroll down, it'll tell us, it'll tell us where um, these items are coming from, what school these items were pulled from. Actually, it, it doesn't give a location. I, I think all those, uh, one, two, three, four, I think all four of those are from the athletic because um, at the time, Mr. Tensei had his had those defibrillators for his, for the athletics because I had ordered the new AEDs throughout the district. So those zones are from the athletic areas, like outside if, the... If, if you look at the age of the defib uh, defibrillators, one was in 2005, 2006, uh, uh, 17, 18, a 13, 14, two 13, 14, one 17, 18, and then we have uh, an oldie but a goldie from 2005, 2006. 
Yeah, I'm just wondering because I know the batteries can be replaced. And then also the um, the adult leads and the child, the child leads can also be replaced, ordered. So I don't know if, if that's what is considered um, them being um, defective. defective because unless they don't, if they don't turn on automatically when you open it, then it's not effective. That, that would, that, I, I'm just, you know, if you open it up, it should automatically come on and and um, uh, do a guidance of how to use it. But if not, if that doesn't come on when you open it, then yeah, it's defective. Right. Otherwise it would be a battery or a lead um, situation. So I've reached I've reached out to Miss uh, Sheba Joe to see if she has a little more information on these AEDs. What exactly um, the issue is with those, but they they all have been um, replaced, um, even though that these items are on disposal. These have been replaced. Well, if they're still usable, you could put them into the buses or, you know, some someplace else. I don't know. But okay. <laughs> Superintendent Carlson. Mr. Deswood is probably on for him. Assistant Superintendent Deswood. Yes, uh, Madam President. Um, on these uh, defibrillators, who who best would we uh, ask these questions to? Because I agree with um, Ms. Uh, Board Member George that you know, in in a in a equipment like that. Um, I think it's just a matter of calibration and, you know, to change parts and the calibration would, um, I'm sure is recommended, you know, from year to year. And, and I say that because, you know, just looking at my old work site, um, these are high dollar equipment and, um, and, uh, and I know they don't change them out often you know most of the time it's it's sent in to to um be um um maintained which is really the calibration part of it and to update any um accessories on on that equipment so thank you for the question uh madam president i think uh, amanda Ms. Sutherland uh, would probably be best to answer mm -hmm. that question since her department is the one that uh, calibrates them and, you know, uh, checks them. And uh, so, yeah, I, I would, I would defer that question to Ms. Sutherland and her department. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just asking, um, would, I'd like a presentation on it in the future. Okay, absolutely. That's something we can note. Ms. Sutherland, can you note that? But from from just for basically, you know, having, you know, four or five defibrillators in in, in my school, uh, sometimes they might be recalled um, if they are, there's a recall on them, very similar to cars. Uh, that could be a liability on the district, um, especially if they are found to be faulty. So I think that's why they're being replaced. If they're recalled, if if, if recalled, then then usually that replacement is free. Right. Then, that's a that's a good point. And then if this is um one of my questions was that if this is defective, then why are we um could we be liable? Uh that is correct. There is liability on the district, uh, and that's part of the reason why they're being replaced. Um, board president, Mr. Des Deswood. Uh, Sheba Joe gave me some more information that might be helpful. Um, the ones that are on this list had an expiration date on them. So they have been replaced. 
And because these items are over a thousand dollars, um, they're issued an inventory tag. So we need to get these items off our inventory because they have been replaced with new units. Yeah. Okay. Um, any more questions, comments, board members? No. Okay, I, we'll, we'll continue on. Thank you. Candace. Thank you, board president. Thank you, board members. We'll go on to item H, SB9, discussion for November election and early bond payoff by Donna Bignazzi, Regina Gassina, and Patricia Ives. Thank you. Hello. Good evening, um, Madam President, members of the board, um, Superintendent Carlson. Um, yes, we are um, at the request of the superintendent as well as working with our bond advisor. Um, we are here to um, have a discussion with the board on the um, uh, early payoff as well as the um, information relating to the November election. This was discussed with the superintendent um, um, last month as well as with Ms. Regina. And I believe we did present to the board um, before the um, close of the year um, a recommendation for the early bond payoff. So the screen is here, just go ahead and update information relating to these two um, aspects and she did include also the the district attorney as well to uh, one of the district's attorneys. Thank you. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Ms. Regina. Um, thank you, Donovan. Uh, Madam President, board members, superintendent, good evening, everyone. So as you might recall from the discussion last year, uh, the district has an option to go out this November uh, 2023 to renew its SB9. And the reason why we're recommending for the district to go out back to voters in November of 2023, because you can now place your mill levy questions only on the ballot on odd numbered years. So if the district chose not to go in November of 2023, you would have to hold a special mail-in only ballot election in order to renew your SB9 mill levy uh, without it lapsing. So the deadline, and um, we have your legal counsel here as well, for the board to adopt the resolution authorizing placing a question on November 2023 ballot is in mid-August of this year. In addition to that, as the district considers reauthorizing its two mil levy, we wanted to see how the district would like to proceed with the payoff, with the early payoff of some of your debt. As we have discussed previously, you have accumulated a significant amount of cash in your debt service account. If the district will not utilize this cash to pay the bonds, and this cash can only be used to pay the bonds early or pay on the existing bonds uh, on the payments that are actually due, your tax rate next year will be set at zero and the following year it will go back up. So our recommendation is to maintain that tax rate stable as you move forward and maybe in the future consider potential uh, bond elections um, and going back out to voters for additional authorizations for projects. Maintaining your tax rate stable will allow for the district, if they decide to do so in the future, to go back out to voters and ask for authorization without a tax rate increase. Large fluctuations in your tax rate, let's say your tax rate does go down to zero and then the district will decide to go back out to voters to ask for an authorization that would require a tax rate of $6.80, you would have to ask 
for that tax rate increase. So we wanted to uh, get a direction from the district on what the next steps are as we're starting to approach those deadlines, both uh, the timing on when we start working with PD and DFA on setting your tax rates as your municipal advisors, as well as working with your legal counsel in the event the board uh, wants to go back out to voters um, ask for reauthorization of SB9 this November. And I would be happy to stand for questions. Any questions, board members, comments, questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, just for clarification, the November election, are we talking about just the school board elections or are we talking about it's a, the, whole the whole thing? Okay. Because the school board elections are not by themselves anymore. It's okay. with the included with, this, with yeah. the county. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments, board members? So, um, is that Pat Ives on five six five five? Uh, Madam President, uh, actually, no, I'm, I'm just I think on that's Zoom. Simple. I think that's super. Oh, okay. Um, you're being disruptive. Five six five five. I think is that Mr. Carlson. If you can oh. mute your phone. Oh, five one two. Is that his? It, it may be Isaiah Valdez. He just called and he's in his car and he, he's getting on. Yeah. Um, have him mute it. Okay. I think he did. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Ives? Yes, ma'am. Um, we're not all lawyers, nor are we specialized in. SB9s, um, everything that she said, can you um, explain? Um, well, not everything, because I'm also not a financial expert like Ms. Gacina, but uh, I can tell you uh, about the election. As she mentioned to you, the November election is the regular local election. And as you said, uh, President Aspis, uh, now it includes not just the school board election, but it includes various um, municipal elections, county elections, hospital board elections, et cetera, et cetera. And it also can include any kind of tax election, like an SB9 or an HB33, or even a bond election, if the board would want that. There could be a question for that. Right now, um, the board's SB9 is still in place. You all went to the voters back in 2019 and they approved the SB9 taxes for a six year period of time. So that would have been 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, and 2024. So you all are good for this year and next year. But as Ms. Gacina also said, the problem is that the regular election only occurs every other year and on odd numbered years. So there will be a regular election this year on November 7th, 2023, but the next one won't occur until November of 2025. So that means that in 2025, uh, by that point, the SB9 taxes will have run out. If you wait until November of 2025 to get the SB9 taxes approved, it's going to be too late to assess those taxes. So what she is suggesting, and I think the recommendation is, is that you take it to the voters this year. And Regina, I don't mean to be speaking for you, or um, I don't know if that is your recommendation, but Basically, what would happen is if you went to the voters this November, you would be asking them to approve the SB9 uh, taxes for 
a six year period beginning. Is that right, Regina, in 24 yeah. or uh, in 25? In 2025. We in would, 2025. Uh, so we would start with 2025, 2026, 2027, 28, 29, and 30. So that would be another six year period. But again, if we wait until 2025 to do it, it would be in November and it may be too late to assess those taxes. And the other problem is if it, I'm sorry, go ahead, Regina. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So um, it's a good point that if you do go out to voters in November of 2025, you will have a lapse in funding. At that point, the SB9 tax rate will be set at zero. And if you go in November of 2025 to ask them for authorization, you will have to ask for a tax rate increase at that point because SB9 has already been expired and would be set for a whole tax year at zero. And, and, and see, that's the thing. If you were to ask for it right now, you would be asking for a continuation of the taxes. Whereas in 2025, it would be at like asking for a brand new tax. Um, and, and so voters would see that as an increase. Now, I think one of the things that you need to remember is that SB9 taxes are very important to the district. And um, I'm not sure if Regina or Mr. Yazi, you can give us what amount of money the district uh, receives from the SB9 taxes each year. Do, do you have- the district probably should be receiving about $1.5 million annually um, on the SB9? Yeah, that's a lot, a lot of money. And school districts, it's not just central, but it's other school districts are extremely dependent on that money. Um, they use it for a number of various purposes. If you don't have that money, then you end up having to use your operational monies. And- um, that that's not good because you need those operational monies for salaries and, and basically to keep the district going on a on a day to day basis. So, again, the proposal is really to just keep this tax going so that taxpayers don't experience an increase and to avoid having to go to a special election either next year or in 2025. I think it's also meant to just keep you on the regular local election schedule so that you never have to pay for an election on your own, but rather can just rely on the regular local election um, uh, cycle. I, I hope that it is, you know, yes. it's a little complicated. It's not as easy as it used to be. Um, back in the good old days before the legislature changed the law, but you know, this is the way it is now. And again, it's just remembering that that money is very critical to the district. Okay, I, with that said, thank you, Pat, um, and explaining. So as a board member, I'm sitting here thinking, um, we know of the closures that, that, had, that have happened and with the plant situation, power plant, and the uh, mining, coal mining. And so that has come about and that's that's happened. And so with the projects, solar projects that were what we were told or what the community, what CCSD was promised um, to continue to make us whole as far as tax revenue, those projects have not even been started, which are two solar uh, solar panel farms. So, and and then our hopes were really on the fact that carbon capturing would have um, would have started at at uh, San Juan Generate. So now that this has come about with the SB9, and I get what you're saying is if we continue it, it would be good for us as far as not paying for our own election and then also with the not having to use operational money from the district. So that's fine, but then 
when I look at my community, my constituents um, in my area, those are the ones that are getting hit with this property tax. And, and so um, with the two projects not running, not even started, um, and then having to, you know, they're, they're, they're paying this through their property tax. And I don't, I don't know if we can still say that it's seven times still, it may be more now. Um, those are my thoughts. And, and then when you think about CCSD, who operates on the reservation and off the reservation, but a majority, and you have to admit to this, but the majority that do vote and pass SB9 or bond, they um, are mainly Navajos which are not the property taxpayers of Kirtland Township. And so in a way you wonder how fair this is, this is, this really is the situation. So I, I just want to throw that out there and um, to me, I feel like because of the breach, because of uh, those the company breaching, I think they should foot the bill. And in order for us to continue, and um, um, that's my thoughts. So I, I just again, I just want to throw that out there. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments, board members? Question. Go ahead. To uh, Ms. Gaisina, um, the numbers that you threw out, that 1.5, I'm assuming that's based off the average over the past five years. And, and again, to uh, Madam President's point, the reduction of San Juan Generation Station, the reality of that 1.5 being reduced um, and you multiply it over the next two years, um, I think we're taking a decent hit as far as um, the amount that we should have received if San Juan Generation Station would be in place. Would that be correct? Um, so we don't have precise numbers. That is just an estimate that I gave you. Um, I think your CFO should be able to give you what you know, in terms of precise numbers, what you guys have collected and reported. Uh, my estimates are just based on the actual valuation numbers that you've had uh, for the past few years. And so far, your valuation has been flat going into tax year 2022. We will see as the tax year 2023 values will start coming out here if any parts have been already phased out um, in terms of the San Juan generation. And that will definitely affect the amounts that you will be collecting in the future. That's that's my point. It's going to be a negative because there's nothing on the horizon to replace that um, revenue to the district. And then again, you calculate that over five years, six years. That's going to be a hit and a reduction that we're going to take. And again, to put that on a small community. Uh, that that really doesn't work. So I think the number crushing, crunching before now in August has to be determined on what is likely to be considered as a, a reasonable collection of taxes over that um, new cycle of, uh, of taxing a property tax, especially for that community when you're where the consideration is to put it up to a vote and put the onus on a community rather than the industries. And uh, it would be nice to be able to try to 
shake that cash out of the pocket to send one January station, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. So we, we have to be conservative and realistic on what we do and how we do what we do. So thank you. The, um, the community will continue paying $2 per assessed valuation. Um, so there will not be a rate increase for them. They will continue paying the same amount if, if you will put the question of the SB9 in front of them. So if let's say you are a homeowner with a home that has a market value of about $100,000, Annually, you're paying about $66 towards the SB9, roughly. So your individual amount of taxes depends on, obviously, the valuation of your home. So the, uh, the district controls only the rate. And there would be no change to the rate. You will continue collecting on the existing authorization through tax year 2024, meaning that your last payment of SB9, if not reapproved, will come in uh, in November of 2025. So after that, you will not be receiving dollars if you don't have a, an authorization in place. So you do still have time. Um, to get SB9 in place if you didn't place it on the ballots um, in November of 2023 by conducting that special mail-in ballot election and as long as you have voter approval by summer of 2025, you will not have a lapse in funding. But obviously, a special mail-in election is something that the district will have to pay out of pocket uh, themselves going to ballots in November of 2023 would not um, be the cost that you would have to bear. Okay, I, I appreciate that explanation, but again, still the fact that you've lost that tax revenue and um, the expectation of just the homeowners that's going to be reduced tremendously, um, or certainly uh, a decent amount that we would receive in that SB9. Thank you. So you were saying then you gave out those figures on a property of a hundred thousand and that they would be paying sixty six um, dollars uh, as far as tax. What would change that condition? The only thing that changes that condition, the SB9, you're approving a rate, right? You're not approving the amount of taxes, you're approving a rate. The individual uh, amount of taxes depends on your value of your property. So if you moved from a $100,000 home to $500,000 home, you obviously will be paying more in property taxes, the district sets the rate, $2. It will not exceed $2 when it comes to your SB9. Um, the max levy, and that's 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 the name, two mil levy. So that is uh, what the district basically controls is the rate. For the next six years, as long as the authorization is in place, the rate is set at $2. The individual amount of taxes fluctuates based on the value of your home. It can go up or down. Because when you receive your property tax bill, you're effectively paying on the value that your assessor provides, which is roughly a third of the market value of your home. So again, if you own a home with a market value of $100,000, for the sake of the example, you're paying taxes roughly on a third of that, on about $33,000. Well, since the taxes are assessed at per thousand um, of assessed value, so you're looking at about $33 here. And since it's two mil, so $2, you multiply that by two, and this is a rough estimate of you know, what a taxpayer is paying towards that SB9. Madam President. Yes, go ahead. So you're saying then that the, the tax bill, as long as the 
property value remains the same is not going to increase regardless of the fact that uh, the power plant is has uh, been taken out of the equation? Uh, no. So the, the property taxes are paid on the amount of the valuation, right, of what assessors basically assesses annually or every two years what the worth of the property is, is it as it relates to your non-residential businesses, as it relates to your, your own homes, um, or there's some state values. Obviously, the state valuations now with the power plant, they're going down. So that amount that you're receiving from there is going down. So this is the direct correlation. However, your homeowners will not be paying more on their individual tax bills because of the uh, valuation of a power plant going down because they're only paying on what is their home worth. They're not bearing the tax bill for the power plant. The effect, the negative effect is at the end of the day is what the district is receiving because if let's say the power plant was worth 500 million and now it's worth only 100 million, you are collecting only 100 um, taxes on a hundred million dollar value from them. However, your residential homeowners, if their house was worth hundred thousand dollars last year and it's worth hundred thousand dollars this year, they're paying on the value of their home alone. Well, that's uh, that's refreshing. My uh, my understanding was that uh, because of, of the power plant. I misunderstood that uh, that evaluation. I thought that that the tax or that homeowners would have to make up that difference. So that's refreshing to understand. I appreciate that explanation. I I still find um, um, that's not accurate, um, Miss Miss. Um, Mr. Gina? Um, that is an accurate information um, because we do have experience working with assessors. We set tax rates effectively as a municipal advisor to over 50 districts in the state. Uh, we work with assessors. We work with San Juan County Assessor. Uh, we work uh, with DFA. So the tax bill is put it based on your own valuations of your home because you're taxed based on the value of your home not on the power plant if the power plant value goes down your overall total collections as a district do go down because as a district you are taxing everyone who is within the boundaries of that district whether it's a residential homeowner, non-residential business, a Walmart or a gas station, or a centrally assessed valuation, which comes from your P&Ms, um, your phone companies. So those are values that are assessed by the state. So you're taxing on that total amount. So if your value go down, you're taxing on lesser amount. But the value, um, it's the it's not the values of what you should be receiving every year is set based of amount of the total valuation, not as let's say the district should be collecting every year, $2 million. And if San Juan um, is not paying, then a homeowner will pay more. That is not the case. Hmm. I I thank you for that clarification. That is uh, refreshing to hear. <laughs> being a if being a homeowner true. and a taxpayer. If if it's factual, if it's true, yes, that's that that would be good. Um, but I don't know how to I don't know how to phrase my question, um, and 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 I'm not being defiant or trying to be difficult here. I'm really trying to 
um, make a good decision. And because that's who I represent is that community as well. And um, and to just go along with a bond and 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 um, when you know majority of Navajo Nation um, Navajos will will decide rather than the Kirtland community, um, you know you 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 kind of have that unfairness there. Um, when Navajo Nation doesn't pay property tax. So I really want to understand. I really want to know so that I make a good decision. And and I'm trying to think of of how to phrase my questions, but, um, you know, I don't have that background. I don't... Um, but most articles, most that I have read on this situation, it, it goes back to that, the um, increased property tax. So there they have their own uh, financial directors, financial people. And if they're saying that one, one too many, I, I don't. I have to believe that. The rate of SB9, though, will would not be increased. Um, it would be obviously set at the two dollars. The what I think you're referring to is probably the geo bonds tax rate. That if let's say the district has lost 75% of its valuation, then there is a possibility that your tax rate could go up. But, but this is not a geo bond, yeah, this, this is, is an not SB9 a tax. Bond. Which is very, if I could, Regina and yeah. Madam President, I think it's yes. important to remember too that the SB9 tax is in place and it will continue for 2023 and it will be in place for 2024. What would be happening if you all were to decide to do this is that it would continue rather than stopping in 2024, it would just continue all the way to 2030. That's that's really the what what the issue is right now. Do you want it to stop in 2024 and not receive that money anymore? Or do you want it to continue up until 2030 at the current um, rate? Mm -hmm. that, and that's really what it boils down to. And I know of um, like in Albuquerque, um, which they put up um request for bonds and it was turned down and so it, um so as you said earlier that then the district would have to go to operational money and i feel like right now is very uncertain and and um We're, we're even getting our hands slapped when we try to, you know, have a cash balance and mm -hmm. and because things are, are so uncertain for the district. And, um, and so even if, if we weren't to do these SB9, um, I believe that the state has um, set us up to um, to this point. Their policies, the governor's policies. This, this, what it, what this is the result, and so. I really hope 
the rest of the board members understand. Um, I'm I'm really questioning this because it's so easy to sit here and say yes, 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 and and um, then put our families, our community, the ones that do pay property tax, and obligate them into this. But I'm I'm really trying to to really understand and research and and do what's right because um and again there's other school districts that have uh voted down bonds and so i'm wondering in that case what are they doing as far as operational dollars or what instead of uh putting more of a tax um on on their communities in our experience um a lot of the district that have their mill levies voted down they go back out and ask voters uh once more to reapprove uh whether it's sb9 or house bill 33 just given like pat has mentioned uh the critical nature of those funds uh Board Attorney Chappelle, Jermaine, I, I don't know if, if you listen to the whole thing. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma um, well, what's your thoughts on this? Well, we've got, yes, ma'am. We've got a couple of different issues going on. We have SB9, which is usually used for um, maintenance of our facilities. And then we have bond debt, which is for capital projects. And I think we may have some confusion um, in the conversation about what what is which. And I, I believe Ms. Gaisina has kind of tried to distinguish between the two as has Ms. Ives. Um, and so I, I think it might be helpful for the board to have kind of an overview of where we are with our bond debt, with our SB9, what SB9 is used for um, so that the board, so that you all have a better understanding of uh, uh, how this fits into the financial picture, um, because it is confusing. Um, and unfortunately, if, you know, our valuation goes down on our industrial complexes, that does hurt us on our bond debt. And unfortunately, um, that does uh, or, or can migrate over to higher tax rates, like Ms. Geisina indicated which would potentially increase residential taxpayer dollars um, because our, our tax rates would, would increase. So what I would recommend board president is that maybe on Tuesday, we, we come back with kind of an overview so that these issues are more easy to um, kind of organize and understand. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. And I'm happy to work with Ms. Ives and Ms. Gaisina on that. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I won't be available if you're talking about next Tuesday. We will be traveling, um, so I wouldn't be able to do a presentation for the board. Um, Ms. Gaisina, would you be available uh, maybe tomorrow for you and I to have a conversation, and, and maybe I could do that in your stead? Along um, with yeah, I'm happy to have a conversation tomorrow. Um, and I think we previously have had discussions with you, um, I believe beginning of this year about the valuations um, and the conversations you had with legislators about the change um, of the valuations and how it, it will impact um, the taxpayer if you lost, like I have mentioned, probably 75% of your valuation. However, right now the district does have enough cash in the debt service to cover two years worth of debt. Right. And just board members, what Ms. Uh, Gaisina is referring to is the change in law when we changed the amount um, or the percentage that the state takes for impact aid. The state also changed the amount um, of percentage that it takes for our, our property tax revenues. Um, and so we now receive 100% of both impact aid and property tax revenues. That's what Ms. Gacy is referring to. Uh, Ms. Chappelle? Yes, ma'am. So um, 
when we had other discussions before, prior discussions with um, <laughs> Ms. Regina, um, that was about the early payoff. Yes. And I've asked, and I, I believe that when it was supposed to be paid off is in 2032? Uh, 2029, your debt will be paid off in 2029. Okay, and it's now 2023, so I asked if there was a, um, I mean, we all pay bills, we all do banking, and so if there's an incentive of um, saving on some of that cost, and then the, we were told no. Um, so again, that makes me think that you know, when we were thriving, when we had the um, economic development here that wasn't being threatened, you know, we could just go wholeheartedly and 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 do things. And and um, but now I, I find that you know our board needs to be a little bit more savvy and. Um, and look at these things as as our own, as as your very own wallet, your very own satchel, your very own purse, mm -hmm. and and start asking these questions um, because, as we talked about earlier about you know our budget and um, you know. We all know that impact aid money, the the hundred percent is not the answer for everything. And then now we look at this, and um, if we don't pass the SB nine, then we'll have to look into operational money. And so there, there's so much, and and uh, that we really need to pay attention to, and 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 start asking these questions. Madam President, if I may, the, the benefit of prepaying the debt early is that ultimately you're saving on the interest amount that the taxpayer is currently bearing for that debt, which they're taxed on. So by prepaying that debt early, you, you would be saving the taxpayer for the next six years about $600,000 in interest. The cost you're referring to is the cost that would district would have to bear is the cost associated with legal fees and financial advisory fees that would be associated with prepaying the debt. So the the at the end of the day, the ultimate beneficiary of the district using the excess cash and paying off that debt early is your taxpayer. Mm -hmm. Just only to go back in and 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 go back into the same situation with the SB9 election? Just a point of clarification, Board President. Um, I know we've kind of broadened the conversation a little bit, but I just wanted to remind that that the issue of paying the debt off early isn't at, on our agenda right now. I thought it was, thought it was, it was early bond payoffs. Oh, it does say it. I'm sorry, I, I glossed over that, my fault. <laughs> I was nervous, yes. <laughs> Okay, so if we can do that Tuesday. Yep. And, um, and then is this the only financial, I don't know what you call them, SB9 firm that we can deal with? That is there others that? Uh, you guys are can hire another financial advisor um, to represent the district. Um, there are other firms in the state that provide similar services that you can retain uh, to be your advisor. We have been advising the district uh, for well over a decade at this point. Uh, we do advise all school districts in San Juan County and represent over 50 districts mm -hmm. in the state. We do represent San Juan College, City of Farmington, City of Bloomfield, City of Aztec, um, as well uh, within the area. So with that said, uh, what are you doing in, in, 
I mean, they're affected by this closure as well. Well, uh, that is correct. They, we, all the districts receive uh, very sim similar advice. Everyone has a very different situation, obviously. Um, the more of an impact is obviously on Central Consolidated. Um, Farmington schools, Bloomfield schools, and Aztec schools have their own unique situations. Uh, and they also have SB9 or GEO bonds. Um, and uh, other districts, uh, you know, consider uh, what works best for them. So each advice we provide is tailored towards um, every district's uh, situation individually. Ultimately, at the end of the day, if the district decides not to do anything, we just need a direction uh, from you on the next steps. But if um, the district would like to um, proceed with another firm, um, that is the decision um, the district can make. Any other questions, comments, board members? No. So, uh, Ms. Ms. Ives? Yes, ma'am. Will you be joining us Tuesday? I, I can be there on Tuesday, but I will okay. say that I don't feel qualified to talk to you about the things um, that Ms. Gaysina would be talking to you about. Again, she's the financial uh, expert. And so I, I can tell you about your options from a legal standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but with regard to, you know, tax bases and that, I, I would really defer to her. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I stay in my lane. <laughs> okay. So, um, Superintendent Carlson or assistant. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma oh. So on, on this SB9 issue, um, uh, we were saying maybe get a have a discussion more on Tuesday. But, that would be good, right? Okay, I'm but, sorry. The uh, financial expert can't make it on Tuesday. Um, and so Ms. Chappelle will, will um, fill us in more on that. That, that works for me. I will be okay. Tuesday. Okay, we'll just do that. We'll go on to item I. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ives. Thank you, and have a good rest of the evening. You too. So we'll go on to item I, Navajo Youth Risk Behavior Survey by Justine Yazi. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, awesome. So good evening, everybody, staff, superintendent, and members of the board. My name is Justine Yazi. I am the senior health educator with the Navajo Health Education Program, which is under the Navajo Department of Health. I oversee the Shiprock, Red Mesa, and Dismalitically um, service areas. This evening, our program will be presenting to um, you all on the board on the Navajo Youth Risk Behavior Survey and to gain your approval and support to implement this survey um, at your middle school and high school this fall. So some of you may recall my presentation last year um, where I did give an overview on the NYRBS, but we weren't seeking approval um, at that time because we postponed it to this year. So I'm going to let my health educator, McGarrett Pablo, take the lead on this presentation today. Uh, good evening, board members, superintendent. 
Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to come before you this evening in order to present some information. Uh, right now, with my name is Miguel Pablo. I'm the health educator for uh, under Shiprock, but I work with uh, DZ Health Clinic out just south of Bloomfield Community. And I just wanted to thank you again for allowing us to do a small presentation about the um, Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Now, if you, in, at the beginning, I would just like to say that uh, the health survey, there's a, uh, before I do that, let me introduce myself. Look at the Nei Bushishin, no diet, the Nei Chanela Equata, the Nen Shlim. Originally, I'm from uh, Crown Point uh, community, but I work here in Shiprock. I can't cancel for the audience, ah, I shall not any no fido. So, with that said, board members, I just wanted to go ahead and begin the youth survey. It's a national survey. And if you were to Google it, it's going to be under the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System or Surveillance Survey. If you Google it, it gives you an idea that this is a national wide survey um, <clears throat> that is conducted every three years. But on this part, what we're talking about is specifically for the Navajo, the, the Navajo Nation part. This survey is going to be geared mainly to the Navajo Nation, and it's given every three years and with the uh, Navajo Nation School as well as Border, border Town Schools. As long as you have a 50% Native American population enrolled in your school, uh, the survey is going to be given. So we would like to do the survey, and this survey that we're talking about it uh, covers six categories. If you will look on the uh, screen here, there's one category, um, injury and violence and the tobacco usage, alcohol and drug use, sexual behavior, weight loss, physical activity. And uh, keep in mind that most of our questions are mainly geared down to where uh, <clears throat> we take in consideration the level uh, reading comprehension of the students. So we try to accommodate the students. So this survey um, is, like I was saying, it does take place every three years and it co goes from the sixth grade all the way to the 12th grade. So you have two different surveys, one for the middle school and one for the high school. The middle school uh, survey uh, has 80 questions and the high school survey has 95 questions. So we go ahead and we come into the school or the school can go ahead and do the survey themselves as we will educate the school in order to do so. But then all, I just wanted to point to the board that all these, these surveys that are being taken, they're anonymous. So no, there's no names on them as long as the students take the survey itself. So it gives the opportunity for the student to share information about what they're exposed to as students, rather than as adults telling, kind of like overshadowing them and thinking that we should uh, provide this type of education or whatnot. The students themselves get that opportunity to share from their point of view. So that's what the survey is mainly about. Uh, in 2017 was the last time that we did a survey. In the middle school, we had um, 80, a total of 85 middle schools on the Navajo Nation that took the survey. And a total of <clears throat> 45 high schools took the survey on the Navajo Nation in 2017. And keep in mind, board members, that the, the results of this survey, the principal they, of the school, the immediate school can ask for results. So they themselves can utilize the results or the questionnaire in order to use as a tool to provide more services for the students. So you can utilize that or if they're seeking funding or you know additional, just what you were talking about just a while ago, seeking funding, grants, or anything like that, 
they can also utilize this information in order to be, uh, fill that uh, requirement. So this is the survey and the principal is that would be able to get a copy and they would be able to provide it to the board members as well so that the board members can have an overall view of the younger population and what's going on in the younger population rather than having to assume or rather to guesstimate what the student population is doing. This survey will at least give us an idea um, what our young population is doing. So what they are exposed to. So a 2017 survey is available. Uh, the principals can request for it and we do have it on file. And we are, if you can contact the Navajo Education Program, we can provide you some information on that. So with that, um, I just wanted to point out also, even though we are asking these questions in these areas, we uh, asking the students about a particular priority health risk behavior does not encourage them to participate in that behavior. Just by asking them a question that um, they might be exposed to, does not, we, we're not encouraging them to do that. We're just asking their point of view. And sometimes at, uh, you know, the information that we get back is really uh, surprising. So being anonymous, the, the student is allowed to share their information. And there's no way that we know which student is providing that survey. So I believe in the past, uh, since the school, consolidated school uh, district has been involved in the survey like this, as you can see, 2008, 2011, 2014, and then just the latest one in 2017. Last year, we sought, uh, we were seeking out uh, approval, but um, we went ahead and we held off because not all the schools were in uh, person classrooms yet. They were still half and half viral, uh, uh, virtual, and then in person too. So this year, this fall, we're hoping to get all the schools back involved. So it's going to be taken this fall. So that's about it. And I'd just like to thank you again. Uh, for your time and this opportunity to present to you. Thank you very much, board members. Any questions, comments, board members? I have a question for you, Mr. Pablo. Yes, go ahead. So, how many uh, or why isn't the total number of participants information on your the number? What do you mean, as far as student count? Yes. All right. Well, let me go ahead and provide that to you. Like I was okay. saying. Two thousand seventeen. There's eighty five middle schools with an estimate of eight thousand two hundred eighty nine students who took the survey, and then also forty five high schools took the survey, and a total of nine thousand twenty three students took the survey participated in the in our YBS survey. Hmm. So overall, yeah, uh, the, you can see the total. The total student count, so eight thousand, you know, nine thousand. Add those together, you're talking close to about what uh, seventeen, eighteen thousand of members of the young population who took the survey overall. Okay. Madam President. And so if you, um, once you do this again with the um, more students available, what do you do with this information? How do you? Is How do we collect it and store it? No. Um, do you just give it to the district and then 
No, we, we give it back to the school. Okay. To the, yeah, to the specific school, to the principals, mm -hmm. and they can go ahead and it's up through. to them to disseminate the information. Mind. And they can utilize it as a tool to improve activities and services at the school. Hmm. Madam President. Go ahead. Go ahead. I didn't, I didn't hear. Uh, are all schools, is this survey going to be taken at all middle schools? Okay. Like I was saying just a little while ago, uh, <clears throat> all the schools, as long as you have 50% Navajo student enrollment, that middle school would be able to take uh, participate in the survey. Okay. So, like, for example, uh, Shiprock uh, Middle Schools, they would be involved in the survey, uh, being a high percentage of being Native American or Navajo enrollment. And then in Kerlin, you know, as long as the uh, enrollment is at least 50%, and then the middle school can participate in the uh, survey. So as far as non-Native Americans, they can also, it would provide them the opportunity to take the survey too. Like, um, you know, but like- ba But basically yes. this, is, this is for the Native population? Um, oh. McGarrett. Yes, go I ahead, Justine. <laughs> so with this survey, this one's um, the one we are seeking approval for is specifically for Navajo area. Um, so each the whole Navajo nation that you know we're split up. So we're um, advocating for the northern agency area. Um, so all the schools that are on Navajo Nation here in the Shiprock, um, you know, the ones that your your school covers. Um, and the ones on borderline. So Kirtland um, would be considered that area as well as other BIE grants. Um, and how do I say, Periarco Church School. <laughs> so those are the ones that are gonna be involved in this survey. So, and I also wanna to touch back to Madam President's uh, question about what we do with the data. So, with this survey, um, yes, the schools um, can request the data back, but this information, it is a CDC, um, an IHS um, survey that they use the data for. So um, part of the information can monitor the progress for that National Healthy People's Objectives for 20, uh, 2030. It also does progress and achieving, you know, those national education goals about safe, disciplined, and drug-free schools. And then it also focuses on, you know, for school health education, teacher training, um, any programs like um, McGarrett mentioned, and just also for whatever um, like he mentioned for your school, if you guys are seeking um, funding for certain, like, physical activities, um, diabetes prevention, suicide prevention, mental health, resources, this data can help support um, your efforts. So I hope that kind of clears, clarifies both your questions. So um, if I may ask, so has, has this particular survey been given to non-Navajo, non-Native, and then um, with the same uh, student count, and then I think we would see if this is bad or not. Um, because right now I look at how this is labeled with Navajo uh, Middle School Youth Risk. And then so are we to assume that because they don't have facilities such as those found in towns, um, like Farmington, they have, you know, um, private gyms and weight rooms, and and then, you know, they're they're closer to these um, um, agencies that can help with um, mental, you know, or with. Um, tobacco or alcohol, you know, there's, there's this, all those, those um, different, different um, 
agencies that can help, you know, like especially under something like United Way. But on the reservation, you don't have those agencies. You don't have that unless it's through a school. And the school is kind of the hub, is the hub. And um, is there a comparison to a non-native? So with the survey specifically, um, like Mr. Pablo mentioned, it's a nationwide survey. Um, the state also implements this survey, um, but what they do is they do it at random. So they just pick random schools, a random age group, classroom, um, whereas we, we do ours as a whole. Um, but yes, I totally understand about, you know, Thank you. Um, the part you were mentioning. Um, I, I mean, you, um, I don't, I don't know if eight percent that rarely or never wore a seatbelt is is good or bad. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I that that's what makes me wonder if if this survey was done to, um, I mean, you're you're picking Navajo on this one, so what about a non-native? Um, community, our school district, uh, what 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 their percentages be in, in those particular, um, the injury and violence and tobacco use, alcohol, sexual behavior, weight control, what would their numbers look like? Okay, uh, excuse me, uh, <clears throat> madam. I would, yes, I get, I know what you're talking about now. You're wanting to compare between uh, Navajo community as far as non-Navajo community. What would be the mm -hmm. difference? How can we distinguish the Native population as well as the non-Native population? That distinction is showing there. But mm -hmm. uh, I would say that this information, this survey is in general for the community and the school overall so that representatives, officials can look at it and say, hey, we need to do some about this, uh, you know, this information. We need to uh, improve education on there. We need to, you know, gather a little bit more resources on there, not specifically, uh, you know, like targeting some specific uh, you know, like uh, the community, at uh, a community-based representatives can utilize this and then uh, go back and then gather some resources and then they can take it upon themselves in order to come up with some uh, solution. That's, I think, um, I'm not too sure if I'm hitting on the nail on the head, but I think uh, this survey is not discriminative to where it will segregate. Mm -hmm. The, the different the population it just gives you the community an overview of what's going on in that community rather mm -hmm. than uh specifying you know different populations but overall like that like for example number one in 2014 you know rarely or never use a seat belt eight percent okay so that tells you right there only uh eight percent uh, you know, nobody really buckles in their seatbelt. So, okay, we need to beef up more presentations on usage of seatbelts, how it can save lives, exposing that uh, information to the student, uh, you know, to the population of that uh, younger generation. Because we, you know, as parents, we know that our children do a lot of joy riding, and that's where the problem comes in. Doesn't matter what population they come from, just in general. Younger people like to joyride. So we need to increase the usage of, uh, you know, seatbelt. That's just an example. So as you go down the list, ever been in a physical fight? 19, 18%, you're looking at a, a percentage in there. Uh, yeah, that tells you that. Yes, there is some physical fighting that's going on. So, you know, social behavior. How can we minimize uh, physical violence in order to uh, kind of like talk out a situation 
rather than using your fist, let's talk about verbal communication. It's kind of like that, just like I was saying, just a tool to show. Or I hope that kind of, I know what you're talking about, or mm -hmm. your question is if you're wanting to compare the two. Now, that one would be a totally different uh, question, survey questionnaire. That one would be a different data collection system. But this one is just how much they know <clears throat> about the topics. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I don't I don't think what what I'm asking, I'm segregating. You already segregated it by putting Navajo middle school youth and in your study, in your survey. So uh -huh. what I'm asking, um, what about the non-native community? Uh it, it'd be interesting to to see what their percentages are and and then to look at our Navajo middle school and see you know how it's different or if it's if it's lower if it's higher or if they're about the same okay. I don't know I, uh -huh. I feel like that would be a thorough survey yeah, so, uh, yeah. under the website Google uh, youth risk behavior they do give you a synopsis an idea of mm -hmm. you know like uh, just nationwide the results of their survey that they did in uh, in a particular area. So if okay. you Google it, they'll give you the their percentage of their results too. Okay. So may I? Yeah. So what you're asking for, um, President Aspis, is the New Mexico Youth Risk and Resilience Survey that New Mexico um, puts on New Mexico PED from the state, and that's the New Mexico YRRS stands for. So this particular one that for Navajo Nation is is like we said for Navajo Nation schools, BIE and stuff. But this one, the New Mexico Youth Risk and Resilience, is statewide for like Farmington, Bloomfield, as yes. they well, do it's fifty percent more. Yeah, where it's just open to anybody, all, all anyone, any mm -hmm. any student in in any Farmington school, Aztec school, Bloomfield school. They take this same okay. test there. And actually on this site, um, they do come in and they they so we so we've done this Navajo Nation one and then youth resiliency will come in and, and do theirs for central too, and then for out there too. So we get both sides. We get this one okay. and then we get the one because they'll come in too at some point and do this risk resiliency mm -hmm. test for our survey for any for anybody in the schools here for CCSD. And actually, uh, I think it's 2013 or 2013, we got a New Mexico Youth Resiliency um, plaque for our students because they were actually um, in better um, safety practices, so to say, than other school districts. So, and they're um, most of the students, um, tobacco use, drug use, drinking was considerably lower than the outside um, general population. So we actually got that, um, hmm. that um, recognition from New Mexico YRRS. Okay, because, you know, just looking at this, I have nothing to gauge it. Yeah. And um, even I'm sure it's different with Pueblo communities. And they so, will go out and do the same thing yeah. over there. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that that was my question. Yeah. <coughs> Any more questions, comments, board members? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Pablo. You. And and I will go back and look and, and look at those numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, may we yes. be excused, Justine and I now? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Have a good night. What if I said no? <laughs> 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 no. Thank you. Okay, we we'll go on to item J.
high school graduation program update by high school principals. So we'll start with our visitor, our audience, Hirsch. Our in-house guests, uh, Newcomb, New Ms. Uh, Ms. Benedict, we're going to start with uh, Newcomb first. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, community members. Good evening, board. Principal at Newcomb High School. I'm here to present the, the information we have uh, going forward for this month. All right. 63 seniors. And when it's completed and exited, 63 students still on track. Um, again, of course, they, they still have to come to school the next six days, take their finals and pass all those. Um, we do have one junior that was, again, able to move up and leave graduating early. We do have, unfortunately, one mm -hmm. transfer student that's classified as a senior, um, transferred in during the fourth quarter because of the credits to transfer in from, they will be short, but they will be able to complete this during the summer. I've talked to that student um, several times in the last uh, week here, and they are excited about being able to finish during the summer. I'm not going to bet again that was a, a transfer student. So again, uh, the plan is to have 63 students possibly walking in, in May. Um, then some interventions. Um, great checks given out. Uh, we actually sent out progress reports this week. Um, I did get to talk to the seniors on, I believe it was Wednesday. We had class meetings, and I made a point to go by and talk to them. Um, we are getting mailing home report cards throughout the school year, and again, also with student-led conferences. We meet with our students, myself, the assistant principal, and our CCR coordinator. We are utilizing credit recovery courses uh, during the school year, so we do have students that go into a classroom to take those classes that they need. And then after school programs, we are offering that two hours, four days a week, where they can do any type of tutor and also use credit recovery time so they have uh, internet access while on, still on campus. So as our big push, we are going to be giving finals starting Monday, Monday and Tuesday, and then Wednesday will be a makeup day. And then, of course, then we still have a few days to, to catch any of those students that might be absent. And then if we scroll down, we have the tentative planning graduation program. We have, uh, passing this out, we have found uh, some correction for name spellings. And so those, some of those changes will be made for that. Where's the rest of the board? I believe um, well, it's on the... Okay. The one in the back. I don't know that I can check. Is that kind of backwards? Well, if you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it opened it up. I'm not sure how it all came out on that page, but and then there's some information on the back. I mean, you know, your title first, then your name. I don't know. To me, to me, I I just I don't know. Um, if you're asking about all the names of the board members, I will check this. And if that's not, I believe it. I believe it's on the last page. In the upper left hand corner. And so you, you have seating for your salutatorian, valedictorian parents? Um, so, well, I will double check, but yes, we will make sure they have seating. Okay. And um, I'm, um, I don't know if you know, but Kirtland, they um, have the parents walk in with their graduate. 
So just just to let you know, which I think is great. I'll make a note of it and see how they plan mm -hmm. to for that procession. I have a question. Um, do you have the the requirement that was stated last last month about students needing to get a ref, um, a letter of reference to a college? Right. Oh, the so, SAT. Yeah. No. Well, entrance into a um, a part of yeah. So right, for next year, for the uh, entrance into a college or university for yeah. next year. Yeah. Do or that they have to, they have that or they have other means of showing that they do have a plan. Oh. Next year. So they yes, they're working with our okay. college and career readiness person at this point. So what are your senior students doing for that requirement? So um most all of them were able to receive something that says they um, have been accepted someplace. Hmm. I don't have the exact percentages and numbers, but I know that was one of the the big pushes for our, our programming this teacher to make sure that happened. Okay. And then also, I'm sorry, I have another question. Um, what about, you do have any issues with um, like regalia or beating of the caps for the parent, for the students? Right, so we're gonna make sure those students receive those. Um, and my thing, you know, going forward on that is, um, as long as it's tasteful, you know, if they want to oh, yeah. do some personalization, I'm more fine, fine with that. We made that known. Yeah, I, I think in the past it's, it's been um, accepted, you know, with, mm -hmm. the, with the traditional wear and then Absolutely. also the um, beading. But I think one thing that we're really going to have to um, slow down on is the lays. Okay. Um, just have to stole whether it's um, personalized or you know, or the what comes with the cat and gown, mm -hmm. but not all this. Some of them are coming up with all <laughs> kinds of stuff, you know, and which is nice, but then, um, that can be later, you know, so. But, yeah, I understand what you're, you're coming from on that. It's it's still part of a school, right? We all want to sort of look alike. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a whole graduation, so mm -hmm. not an individual. It's the same. It's a school mm -hmm. event. Yeah, or like having a feather off of the cap. Right. So, and, you know, to go along with what you're saying here, talking about our, our seniors and expectations, when I did talk to them this week, one of the expectations is also that one um, during the rehearsals and the actual day of the ceremony that they come sober and not to do anything to get themselves in trouble. Oh, no. Um, and Tony, I hate to say this, but, you know, just make sure you understand students. It's still a school function. Make sure mm -hmm. you, come to, you know, come on campus. Yeah. And and I believe in your area, uh, one thing that needs to be considered in Assistant Superintendent Deswick, Yes, I'm here. So um, as designee for Carlson, um, I hope there's um, um, I don't know what you would call that team, but you know, some type of response in case in case it's needed. Last year we were lucky, very lucky that uh, Navajo Nation police was in the area. So, um, especially out there at Newcomb. So, I, if if we can have that, right, and I do have an answer for that. You know, talking with our LSA on campus, we plan on having between LSAs and the the security that's hired through the district. We're going to have nine individuals mm -hmm. um, during the ceremony. Even um, a a a um, first aid first aid. Right. And and we do have the fire and rescue that's mm -hmm. right, right basically on campus, so we'll, we'll make sure we notify them yeah. for them to be on standby. Yeah. Okay. Thank Any you. questions from the board members? Oh, Mr. Desward. Oh, Mr. Desward. Go ahead. 
Uh, Board President, yeah, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Brooks is correct. We, uh, I did see POs. Uh, POs are being worked on for, actually, there's an open PO for security and uh, uh, the safety coordinators, Mr. Volhurst and uh, Mr. Griego, uh, are, are, do have in place uh, additional security uh, at those, at Newcomb especially, but also at the other two high schools, actually, other three high schools as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your time. Oh, I do have one question. Sorry. No. Um, what is what is your bag? It, or Mr. Deswood? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, what is the district's protocol for um, bringing in food and bags this year? What What's the whole district on one page is thing on that? Bags and food. As far as bringing them into the graduation ceremony, yes. Uh, you know that's a that's a good question. I don't recall seeing any uh, parameters as far as if staff, if uh, parents, families, community members can bring uh, food into the uh, graduation ceremony. But that is something we can look at. And then the bags, because before it was just the baby bags and a small purse. Mm -hmm. to be brought in but <coughs> for safety reasons yes that's something that we can look at i think very similar to uh concerts you know they have to have small bags or purses uh, yeah that's something that we can look at yeah if we could get a decision on that and then if they are to only bring small bags or, and just a diaper bag and nothing else, we need to get that out right away because they get really upset at the door. Really or upset. Even that just um, to be inspected. Yeah. If, mm -hmm. if they declined for inspection, then no. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we will look into that and get something out as soon as we can. Uh, we do have about uh, a little less than two weeks until graduation starts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, comments, board members? Okay. Thank you. Okay, next. Are you ready for me? Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, Board President Aspis, Superintendent, Superintendent Designee Deswood and board members. Uh, here is the update for Kirtland Central High School from April uh, to just a couple days ago. Um, we increased by three students. We had 156 last time we presented. We now Yay. And uh, we moved one junior up to senior status. So now there's 19 juniors that have moved up to senior status. Um, the other information has stayed the same except on that bottom, but, but that bottom um, number where it says four will graduate by summer or December. Last time it was three, but one of the students who checked in, same situation as a newcomb, checked in with not enough credits, so he's going to have to go to summer school. Uh, so that, that was the addition of that fourth student. We're anticipating 155 students to walk in May, and of course, it's the final word is uh, the, the uh, grades from San Juan, and uh, the, that's the credit recovery class and the final exam grades. But we go over this every day. So we're pretty um, sure about our numbers, uh, barring any uh, catastrophes there with final exams or uh, grades from San Juan. The interventions are the same as I listed before, after school credit recovery. Uh, that VLN again is credit, is credit recovery um, tutoring online. SPED support, I talked about the SIT teams that we have in advisory with the teachers who are meeting with students and wellness checks, the resource class pullouts, the inclusion, the SEL and social workers, restorative solutions. Uh, what I added there um, on that lattice um, one there is one-on-one -on -one support because since last time we met as we got closer to graduation, instead of meeting once a week, we've been meeting every day and uh, pulling those students and calling parents and taking them out of uh, you know elective classes and having them work with teachers and support people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, 
attendance incentives and award ceremonies, elective credit retention, mentors, peer tutoring, robocalls, meeting with parents, senior letters, and uh, college uh, career readiness support. So that's the update for the numbers for Portland Central. Yeah. Okay, so here's our work in progress for the program with the class motto, it is what it is, and uh, our colors and our flowers and our songs, and then uh, the listing of the student body president, vice president, principal, and of course um, there, if you wanna check, we had a couple different people check um, in terms of the board members, the spelling of the names to make sure that it's correct. Of course, if we have any errors, we'll we'll change them, but I think we've, we've got it correct. You can misspell my name. <laughs> 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 you can put C. George. C. George. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is uh, still uh, the presentation of Colors National Anthem Master Ceremony. We're still waiting to fill that in with student names. And then, of course, the valedictorian has already been notified, and her parents also, as well as the salutatorian. Mm -hmm. And the student body address, the farewell address, the certific certification of graduates, acceptance, presentation of diplomas, uh, the Sassel Ceremony and the Recessional. And there are your top 10% uh, graduates on the uh, underneath there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else on there, Sharon? And then on the, we, of course, we haven't listed the students' names yet, the graduates, because we don't do that until just a couple, just before we print them, because these students are making up and putting their assignments right until the very last minute. Looks good. Thank you. Did anyone have any questions about our numbers or anything on the program? You don't have any that are um, special where they are um, have their associates before they graduate. Yes. yes, that one student graduating with associate's degree in liberal arts, we do have one student. Uh -huh. And then I found out today also, um, that'll be in the speech, but there's a a student who should be getting their CNN um, certificate also. Wow. But that'll be in the, that'll be in the sp speech. And then I'll recognize the five students that we had who got the um, seal, uh, bilingual seal. Bilingual, yes. Spanish, yes. Uh -huh. So yeah, in my speech, I always incorporate, I try to recognize as many students and parents as I can. That's basically what my speech is, more of a recognition of the accomplishments that they've had. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Okay. Any questions, comments, board members? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, President Aspas, Assistant Superintendent Deswood and board members. Um, this that you're seeing right here is our program for the Shiprock High School graduation ceremony. It is still a work in progress, but we are getting there, it's almost done. I'm not sure if this is a completely updated one. Ms. Ray, I think there was one more, but maybe you don't have it. The board names will go right under here. They're on the, a new one that was updated this afternoon. It will go right under the class officers right here. Can, let me see. I had just sent another one because we were updating all afternoon. Ms. Ray, do you happen to have it or? If not, I can send it to the board. 
If you have it on your screen, Ms. Gallagher, I can give you the host and you can show that if you, if you would like. Okay, let me find how to get to it on my screen. I've got to make this smaller. Okay, do -do -do. Except full screen. Okay, yes, I'll pull it up. Just remember to turn the host back to me. Okay. You are Wendy Bears. Yeah, don't hate. <laughs> okay. So now, Mr. Gallagher, can you come show me how to share my screen? Yeah, you're too nice. <laughs> okay, share screen. Got it. Okay. Okay, so here it is in progress in Canva. So um, I gotta move this so I can see it. Okay, so the class officers are here, school board, district administration, and school administration for that work in progress. And then this is just the order of events. The names will be filled in as we know them. And then the student names will be in the back. Um, Val and Sal and the top 10 will all be notated on the back by the student's name on the next page. I have a question. Miss Rebecca, do your all your parents walk out with their graduates or just the Val and Sal? <clears throat> they walk out with them, but the Val and Sal parents sit with his teachers on the left and the other parents sit up on the stage. But they walk across the field with them. Okay, so all parents. Honor parents, the top Just 10 percent. Honor parents, your top 10? Okay. Yeah, yeah not, all, not all the parents, yeah. Okay, I was trying to see logistically how that would work in the pit. And so, okay, thank you for the clarification because I like the idea. Okay, sure. so um, are there any questions on the program? Um, well, you, you, you made me come up with a question for all of the schools. But is the assistant superintendent listed on your program too? Yes. Okay. Okay. That was my question. Okay. Thank you. And then, um, I, I before I forget, we had a situation last year where then we had election year last year, so you had everybody wanting to be on the stage. You remember that, Ms. Gallagher? Yes, I very much remember that. <laughs> and so, um, and then also with um, scholarship. And right. so if that happens. Um, so we, um, we've talked to all of our scholarship. Um, you can stop share if you guys are done looking at this program. And then I can address those other things. Can, can I finish? Yes. So, so with that scholarship, the the person came here and, and asked, or there was a letter given. And so the board consented, said, okay. But they come graduation day, and the, the scholarship was only to Shiprock and Newcomb, and so, but one of the conditions was for him to get up on stage and give the scholarship, and that was not, um, everything was set, and so Shiprock, and I'm, I'm really um, glad that Ms. Gallagher kept to that, but Newcomb ended up changing their program to include him, and um, and then I, I guess in retaliation, the graduate here at Shiprock didn't get their scholarship. So, but we had to fight for that because it was already said here in the boardroom, ratified by the board to go ahead and give that scholarship. So we gotta be careful those things. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, go ahead, continue. Okay, thank you. And I agree, Ms. Aspis. And I did talk to that very company again this year and told them when our senior awards are next week and they are going to give that scholarship there, I believe. Okay, that's so, good. Yeah. 
So Sharon, you can take back your screen. And then is my, um, the slide I sent earlier this week, is it still there? No. Okay. Yeah, so let me get that for you, hold on. Mr. Deswood have a question? Um, Mr. Deswood, do you have a question? Your hands up. Oh, I apologize. That was uh, earlier for when Mr. Brooks was presenting. Mm. I'll take it down. Mr. Brooks is still here if you want to. <laughs> I apologize. I was providing clarification for the PO that's in place for security services at graduations. Mm. Okay. Okay, so here is our other slide on our students. Um, our students also went up by one. We had a senior move in. Um, unfortunately, that senior's several credits short. They won't be graduating until next December. Um, they just were too short when they moved into the district. Um, we have 120 seniors, 11 have completed and already exited. There are 108 on track to graduate. The one student just transferred, they'll not be able to meet graduation requirements at this time. Three juniors will be early graduates. One of them has 38 college credits. Um, no, at this time, we spoke to Ms. Perry today. I do not believe any life skill students are choosing to stay. Any life skill students who could graduate are graduating. So they are part of that 119. As of when I wrote this as of Monday, 69 seniors have earned 630 college credits. And that will increase after we get final grades. We got them today. So we have several, several seniors who have earned many, many college credits. One senior in particular has earned 58 college credits and is one course shy of her associate's degree. So, um, that's where they stand. 100% of our students, all students do have either the letter or the military or their plans in place. There are no students waiting on any of that. So in case you had that question, that 100% of them have met with the college and career readiness person and they have all of that in place. Um, we are still doing graduation grade checks, only instead of every two weeks, we're doing them about every day. and. Um, our college and career readiness and our counselor meeting with those kids one-on-one -on -one daily. Um, we've met with some parents. We haven't met with any parents in a while because our kids are all standing pretty good right now, as long as they all take their final exams and, you know, continue going to class for the next couple of days and, you know, take their finals. Um, like I said, hundred percent have met with the CCR to complete their future plans. Um, Night school and credit recovery, we still had some going on. I think we are about done with that. We do have some kids taking credit recovery courses. And um, that's one of those things we have to make sure that we keep checking in with them, make sure they're doing all right, make sure they're going to finish those. And we do have a lunch school program for tutoring and credit recovery. And with that, I will stand for any questions. Any questions, board members, comments? <laughs> so all the students that um, that didn't, you know, they they're lacking or their parents do know. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Um, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. You too. Good evening. 
uh, board president Aspas, esteemed board members, Mr. Deswood, my fellow principals and other guests. Uh, got a little update for you here tonight. Uh, we started the year with 46 seniors. We have increased our number of students who are have met their graduation requirements by May 1st, a couple more. So we're sitting right now at 26 graduates already. We have 14 more that are on track to graduate uh, that with the classes that they have and nothing nothing else. Uh, we have seven more that are that are finishing a night school independent study, and then a couple who may have to go to nights or to summer school to finish up. We're looking at a total of possibly 46 students to walk uh, in two weeks. Uh, we're, we're very proud of what we've what we've been able to accomplish this year and how many students we've been able to move forward. Uh, we did have one uh, student come back to school this last quarter who is not going to be able to make it, but he is going to be very close to summer school. We're going to work with him and try to make sure we get him out as quick as possible. Uh, graduation plan. Uh, we will be, <clears throat> graduation will be taking place at the Phil, Phil L. Thomas Performing Arts Center on the 24th at 7 p.m. Board members will be seated on the stage and parking will be available for you on the east, east side of the pack. Uh, the back, the front doors will open at six. However, board members uh, and the graduates will be able to enter through the south, excuse me, the southeast side. Uh, we'll, I'll be sending formal invitations out to the board members and uh, uh, the program is pretty much complete. We may have a couple of kids that, that get added or deleted, but outside of that, we're, we're in pretty good shape. Sharon, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and roll down to the first page. So what we have here, we have the front and back cover. Uh, the front cover has the Phoenix on it with our, with our logo. Uh, the class is on the back there. Uh, we have designated our valedictorian, salutatorian, our grad students who are uh, have completed the grads program and are, um, <laughs> excuse me, mothers and fathers of children. And then also we had our new equity council this year. We're going to honor those students also. On the inside page, we have the, uh, the Board of Education, uh, CCSD administration, uh, school, staff, our motto and information there, and then the program. Okay. Any questions? No. Any questions, comments, board members? I guess until you spelled her name wrong. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> just pick one you can pick me mr g oh come on i got yours on there i guess i could have put you a cj yeah c george <laughs> not cj okay <C> george. <laughs> <laughs> can you have a buffet for us oh i hadn't planned on that <laughs> i'm kind of i'm kind of out of po's right now i gotta put that in for next year uh <laughs> So I appreciate it. We're looking forward to hosting you next uh, Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. And you do have seating for the salutatorian valedictorian's family. Yes. Uh, yeah, we'll have they have reserved seating. We've already put it in place. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. You. So we'll go on to item K. Item K, request for approval of gift donation from Cellular One for Newcomb Elementary School. 185 skateboards and helmets by Herman Gleason. Wow. Herman. Mr. Gleason. Are you really ready to skateboard? Pony <laughs> <laughs> Hawk. Oh, oh. Yeah, hey, oh, uh, Ms. Aspis and Mr. Carlson and Mr. Deswood. Oh, yeah. The adult Cheryl, yeah, hey. Yeah, yeah, hey. <laughs> oh, hey, Krishna, hey. Um, I know, I'm going to ask you, 
نخه سو ام هش اشنی تو باهی باشش چین دو کتلی چینی داشت چه دو نخیر نه داشت نله اید نش لاغ خود ات از نش کیج نشا سو سلیر وان uh it was not quite cellular one who reached out to me last month it was for kinship uh amy the net deal is the one that reached out to me last month wanted to know if we would accept uh some skateboards and for kinship is an organization they call themselves the Nascape Garden Project so they've have selected few schools uh, in within the United States so they selected Newcomb Elementary and I don't know if you have heard uh, last month they were at Tolina boarding school and Sanasti Day mm -hmm. school where they had um Bo and Tony Hawk so mm -hmm. We're going to have a very similar situation, and we are so super excited about this. So um, we mm -hmm. I could not just turn it down because, you know, uh, skateboards, you know, a lot of our kids cannot afford it, let alone a helmet, you know. So uh, this mm -hmm. is a, an opportunity. I know there will be a couple of um, pro skateboarders coming over and sh demonstrating um the, the, the skateboarding safety, um, you know, they're, they're going to short um, show and tell their stories on how they became, you know. So that's our plan. Um, the only thing we have right now is they're going to be showing up in the morning um, next Wednesday. And then we're going to uh, migrate up to Tallinn, not Tallinn, to Gray Hills, that newly built skating uh, park. So that's the plan we have. So we are so fortunate to have this opportunity for our students. So uh, I just cannot say no. And our one of our guest speaker is Chapo. I don't know if you heard him, Brian Chapo. He's one of the uh, the net pro skateboarder will be coming over. So I don't know if Amy is here. She's one of my co. Cool, she's supposed to be online, but I don't know if she is. Did she log on, Sharon? No, she's not. Okay. Well, I guess I stay for questions, so. So, um, any questions, comments, board members? I have a comment. Go ahead. <clears throat> so, Mr. Gleason, we better see you do a 360. You better start practicing. <laughs> <laughs> I have enough titanium in my in my body already, so I don't need another one. <laughs> Now, good job mm -hmm. for accepting that for your kids out there. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But, I think, I think I would like to invite you guys to, you know, uh, be part of us. You know, it, it'll be it'll be a great opportunity. So on on your form, um, it's dated five seventeen twenty three. So would that date change to today? Uh, five seventeen is the date uh, for kinship organization was available. Mm -hmm. It's either I accept it or they move on to the next school. So oh, okay, I had to make that decision. So you know, I had to make that call. Okay. Just so it's clear when it was accepted by the board on okay. that form. Any other questions, comments, board members? 
Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gleason. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Making those making this happen. And I know that Tony Hawk um event was very popular, it was all over Facebook. Mm -hmm. And um I I think it's just one of those um who would have thought, you know, <laughs> that yeah. our, our our Navajo children would would really, you know, go out and and wanting to do that? And I see more um, girls, which is great. I think so. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we'll go on to item L. Johnson O'Malley report by Mia. She said her name. Board President, uh, we also have yes. Isaiah Valdez. Okay, let's do the Johnson O'Malley report. Thank um, you. Mia. Is it Suentes? 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good evening, Board President Aspas, Superintendent Carlson, Assistant Superintendent Deswood, and members of the board. My name is Mia Cientes. Yeah. And this evening, I'll be doing a requested Johnson O'Malley monthly school board report. And if we could go to the next page, Ms. Ray. So I started with an introduction for our recent needs assessment for school year 23-24 based on the research that the IEC did through monitoring and school visits through the past school year and as well as the JOM family survey that was shared with the communities in Newcomb, Kirtland, and Shiprock and the needs assessment. Very brief synopsis of what we made was the JOM will focus on teaching students understanding and knowledge building of their identity language and culture to include their social and emotional needs and to support a student for academic achievement at all grade levels. Uh, if we go to the next page, I have our Indian Education Committee page. Um, IEC current members are nine members still within each region, persons acting in local parentis. None of the eligibility requirements have changed. We are still currently meeting every second Tuesday of the month from September through June. We have a full seat in the Shibrock region. Um, we currently have no active parents in the Nash City Newcomb region, as well as the Kirtland Oho region. We do have our representative from Dream the Nash Charter School seat filled, and our next meeting is on June 13, 2023. On to the next slide. May I ask a question before you go go further? Yes. So, um, so there, you, your your um, members are only nine, and no, we um we have nine seats available, and out of nine, we have four active parents. So, how does that? How do you end up with a? Quorum, a legal quorum. And our in our bylaws um, that I reported a few months ago when we were doing the application, in the bylaws we stated that um, two members can constitute a quorum to get started. And so far, our meetings have been meeting quorum. All four members are active. Um, we haven't had to cancel. That's interesting. And JOM knows of this? Yes. And the bylaws were um, presented and approved by um, the school board. Um, Navajo Nation JOM program is aware of it. And currently, we are still recruiting parents in both Newcomb and Kirtland, but we just haven't had any success in the, the, the parents signing on. Yeah, the board may have approved it, but 
I think all the those um, IEC policies were done without any board uh, participation. Okay, go ahead, continue on. Okay, on to the next slide. I have ICO JOM administration um, from the administration program at at the district level. We've had initiatives to start chapter house involvement by doing monthly reports on the program. Uh, we'll set up more booths and at community events and school functions, visit schools to provide information on programs, um, CCSDs has a more active participation in Navajo Nation JOM events and activities. Next slide, please. Uh, I have upcoming events and activities. Currently we have our end of year language and culture celebration and next year's activities are in the planning stages with the rest of the department and what is um, written into the education plan for the next school year. Uh, I have some program data. Very briefly, Johnson O'Malley has serviced 300, at least 350 students with parental cost services for senior graduation, eyewear, after school programs, and school supplies. We've serviced over 110 CLRI holistic connection and STEAM related field trips. We've provided to three locations in Kirtland, Shamrock, and Newcomb with traditional sewing workshops and provided services to all regions and various teachers for different student culture language events by inviting 31 local consultants to provide uh, cultural presentations and services. Uh, the next slide has finances. The current contract number 15546 had a total balance of $449,123.36. We have a deadline, ex our deadline extended into December 31st of 2023. We've currently spent $296,592.68 and we have a remaining balance of $209,217.40. And, 40 cents. and just a very brief explanation that J Johnson O'Malley is always one month behind. So this balance here doesn't include the invoices for this current month of May. That balance will be updated at, after May has concluded. Um, the Johnson O'Malley application for school year 23-24 was submitted. And these next steps include adjusting rates and amounts based on school year 23-24 indirect cost rate, adjusting budget balance based on the final tribal priority application, which we just received last week and are currently in the planning stages of updating the budgets for the education plan and the components. Uh, Navajo Nation JOM will be scheduling a negotiations meeting with CCSD personnel. This meeting is likely to be had in June. We're going to send Navajo Nation JOM updated documents once July 1st arrives, as that's when the new fiscal year begins, and updated documents such as the liability forms will have to be updated in the application. And that gets submitted on behalf of us by the Navajo Nation JOM program as it goes through the 164 process. So it doesn't delay that process. It just gets added or replaced during that time. <clears throat> Next slide, please. I've provided a tentative 2023 timeline highlights. In June, we, like I had mentioned previously, we have our last regular IEC meeting. In July, we'll establish the school the JOM administration at CCSD will establish the budget to reflect the JOM education plan. In August, we'll begin streamlining JOM to the schools and communities. In September, the IEC will return to begin their duties and responsibilities with their first meeting. And our target goal is to streamline JOM early in August. Next slide, I've provided 
our current events on our district website. Um, I've provided a link and a QR code. This is where most of our announcements are made. Um, any final thoughts? I do stand for questions. Are there any questions from the board? Yes, the, um, any questions, comments from the board? I have no questions. Um, I have a question. Um, I, I did, um, while well, I was trying to look for the email, I, I can't seem to find it, but um, I did ask after that tribal consultation um, done with Dodie um, and some of the stuff that was shared. And anyhow, I asked about giving a letter grade on um, our part, a CCSD, and it didn't look too great. It, um, I think what came back was a C, a D, and there was a couple of questions that weren't even answered and um, that, that um, these evaluators were, were asking. So, um, To me, that 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 was disappointing to see, and um, hopefully, in the future, that we can up that that um, that grade. Were you aware of that? I did attend the tribal consultation that was held at Bon Wilson, but I was not part of the follow-up. Superintendent Carlson? Sorry about that. It took me a second. Yes, ma'am. Um, we were talking about that tribal consultation that took place and. I mentioned about the letter grade and what, what was said, what was shared by the evaluators. Mm -hmm. And um, apparently that's not been um, shared with, um, with Mia. Okay. I can make sure that happens. I did send it to all directors um, immediately when I received it, as I sent it to all board members as well. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, I will definitely ensure that I do get a copy of of that letter grade and share it with the IEC members as well. That way, if there's any improvement requested from JOM, we can definitely address it right away. Yeah, I I really don't think um, there was fault in the IEC members. I believe the ones that were there were um, administrators, so, but thank you. All right, thank you for your time and allowing me to provide my presentation. I will be providing another one next month. Thank you. Any more questions, comments, board members? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll go on to item M. Report on unisex restrooms by Amanda Sutherland. Good evening, board president, board members, Mr. Carlson. Um, so tonight I'm um, providing information on um, Title IX and some gender neutral bathrooms and also New Mexico HB 134. So we'll start with um, recent changes to Title IX. And again, this is just to give information for the board to make an informed decision 
um, when it comes down to it. So over the last few years, there's the changes to Title IX at the federal um, level. And the case law interpreting these changes to Title IX have created confusion about whether public schools can restrict transgender students' ability to access public schools' bathrooms consistent with their gender identity. And then I just cited the article. In the past several years, federal courts have disagreed about whether school policies that prohibit transgender students from using the school bathroom consists with their gender identity violate Title IX and the amendment. So <clears throat> CCSD's implementation of changes to Title IX, given the unsettled status of the law, as well as privacy and safety considerations, many public school districts have responded to this uncertainty, uncertainty by providing students with access to gender neutral bathrooms. CCSD provides students with access to gender neutral bathrooms um, in the nurse health offices, as well as other additional designated gender neutral bathrooms, depending <laughs> on availability in school buildings. So implementation of um, House Bill 134 is um, access to menstrual products to all students. Since 2018, through partnership with QUEC, CCSD has provided access to menstrual products to all students. <clears throat> so we're kind of ahead of New Mexico right now. So House Bill 134, um, Senate, it was um, the bill sponsor was Senator Leo Jaramillo in, from Española, and he spoke of period poverty which is when low income women and girls struggle to afford menstrual products and the additional burden for individuals to purchase menstrual products. Jaramillo also said stocking the boys' bathrooms allows them to bring the products to family members. So what this means for New Mexico schools. Um, effective date, the new law is June 30th, 2023. Products shall be provided at no charge to students in each woman's bathroom and gender neutral bathroom, at least one men's bathroom, in every public elementary, middle school, junior high school, secondary school, and high school. And then there's um, also money that will be provided to districts. So $3 million is appropriated from general fund at PED for expenditures in the fiscal year 2024 for the purchases and installation of menstrual product dispensers and the purchase and distribution of the products to public schools. So what are the next steps for CCSD? So we're still waiting for um, a memo or you, what happens is, is that PD, they um, address it through a memo and then it gives the district's direction. And then also New Mexico School Board Association. And I'm pretty sure they're gonna come out with a policy, a board policy that'll be sent to the board for um, approval. So since, again, since 2018 in partnership with QUEC, CCSD has been doing this already. Um, we've been providing um, products through um, an MOU and the products are in all the health offices district-wide. Um, some girl bathrooms, uh, we have baskets that are placed in the restroom for easy access. The reason why it's in some is because, um, you know, they, girls will be girls and they've flushed them down the, or stopped up the toilets and stuff. So we um, had to just adjust, but they are available discreetly in the nurse's office and then um, counselor offices and places like that. So um, we also do distribution at community events, such as athletic events, um, election fairs, summer holiday lunch program, and through the ICO pantry. So what is the Quex Society? So their mission is to meet the need. So um, I just posted their mission and I'll read it. We at the Quex Society are focused on supplying, sorry, I can't see on my screen, are supplying indigenous students and communities the period products they need to maintain their dignity and celebrate their strengths and, and moon times. 
We collaborate with schools and programs in rural areas, suburbs, and cities across North America to eliminate period poverty among Indigenous people. We educate about moon time as a time for celebration, and we work to support the dignity and strength of all we serve. So again, we have the um, MOU, which is a Memorandum of Understanding, and it's good right now, August 1st to the 23rd, so they'll probably be coming in June or July to um, re to renew this with the board. <clears throat> so our agreement through the MOU is accept the shipment of supplies and other items. So it's pads, tampons, books, masks, underwear, bras, and we distribute to, um, to students in the district and the community members as in need. So that's where we are at now. So I thank you board for your commitment to CCSD. And I stand for questions. Any questions, board members, <clears throat> comments? I have a question. Go ahead, Ms. George. No, go ahead, let Gary go. Um, Montoya. Board member Montoya. So that one section we talked about, uh, uh, keep going down. A little more. Right there. Oh, 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 stop, stop. Go back up a little bit. Right there. Recommendations provide written comments to NMPED and MSBA regarding cultural considerations. Are we submitting something to them in that respect? That would be my recommendation. So if you would like for us to do that, then we can work with um, Ms. Chappelle and get that done. Yeah, I believe we did say that, but um, I guess in the respects of making it official, that would be the termination of the board come next week then. So, all righty, that answers my question. Thank you. I have a question, Mark. Go ahead. What would be the um, written consider? What would be the written cultural considerations? From from what I'm understanding is that from the last discussion is um, and again this is just providing information and and gathering more information for you guys or whatever we need to do. But from what I understood when I was asked to do the presentation was that there was um, just conversation about. Um, the the bill the bill had passed but it seemed like the board was feeling like central wasn't um, taken into consideration for the cultural aspects of what this could entail and Ms. Chappelle could probably answer as well if there's more to say on that but we were my goal was um, to provide some guidance and let you know as a board what we're doing right now and how we're ahead right now of the game, I think, because um, not everybody in New Mexico is doing this. I think we're the only district that um, is is doing it. I don't, I don't know what other districts, but Okay, my my thoughts on that bill is that um, there was no um, as far as culture, and I don't have a son. I don't have a grandson, but I do have, you know. Um, male, you know, kids, elementary or, or high school, but um, in my upbringing, uh, it was always said that those menstrual, um, those products, they're 
there's a way that you take care of them and dispose of them. And and then um, we could be, and, and that's really presuming, but we are in a place that um, It does. It does. Um, we you have to you have to consider our culture, our traditions, and you may have that family that has perhaps the they want the boy to um, grow up and be a medicine man. He's set on that track, and yet you know goes into a restroom and sees things like that. Um, I was, I was brought up to, um, to where male boys, they're not supposed to see those stuff. They're not, it drives them crazy. And, and, um, and, and I think crazy is a broad term. We, we really don't know, but. To me, it 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 um it entails a lot, and so we may be sitting here and comply to this bill, and then yet um be liable. You know, where a male student goes back and says, "You know, I saw this," and then the parent is is upset and. and and um, could be taken to court. So, you know, it's presuming a lot, yes, but I think um, legislators, legislation needs to learn that they need to do their due diligence and they do have, what, over 20 plus tribes Pueblos, I don't know what Pueblos do. I don't know what Hopi does. Um, but, and all I know is the Navajo culture side of it. So they, those things should have been asked and, um, and considered before um, passing these bills. Thank you. May I work with you? Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> so my um, my thoughts on this is that, um, you know, I think it's per family, how they raise and how they teach their, their children, because I have boys and my boys, and I have my daughter, my boys would, they're comfortable enough to go into the store and get their sister feminine products or myself, you know, if they, if needed, because they were taught that way, they were taught that it's a, a gift of life. And they were taught that that's the only way life um, is given and to protect it in that way. And that it's, it's considered very sacred and not to joke around about it. So if the boys would see that, feminine product in the bathroom, I'm talking about my boys, it wouldn't bother them. They would be like, oh, you know, maybe, maybe Ashi doesn't have feminine products at her practice. So I'll take some for her. And it's not a, it's not, you know, a thing. And then um, also um, the fact that we have transgender students who believe that they are boys and they will go into the boys restroom and they're transgender so that need for that feminine product is there in there in the bathroom for them to use it and so that's another thing to consider and then also um you know as miss aspis has mentioned um the traditional side of like a medicine man and again i think that just goes back to the family practices that what's taught in the home because um, I have um, I have somebody in my family who who does that, and like I said, they're 
very um, cautious about how they talk about it and like how the Kiwik societies um, introduced why they provide feminine products to indigenous um, young girls is because of the moon phase as they were um, um, put that to the women's menstrual. So um, it's, you know, I, I think um, it's very, it's a very touchy subject, but I think it just goes back to every family's um, household, how they incorporate that and how they teach their, their, their students or their, their kids. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and also, um, you know, um, what else are you going to say? I forgot my train of thought, but um, anyway, um, I, I think it's, uh, I, I think we have to, um, you know, really, consider following the recommendation or the, the protocols because like I said we have transgen transgender kids who go into the restrooms and um I know for a fact that some of them do go into the boys restrooms or the boys locker room and you know we haven't got to that step yet but um you know if they have access to that in there then they'll utilize it and then the only other thing that I have a um, another concern about Ms. Sutherland is the use of having kids who, um, for the restroom, going to the health office, that breaks their confidentiality of being, um, of their sexual orientation that they choose because everybody knows, oh, so-and-so has to go into the nurse's office to use the restroom because they are such and such. And so I, that's why I think that we need to um, have CCSD, um, Mr. Carlson and Mr. Uh, Deswood, uh, get with Ms. Candace um, Thompson. And we need to, uh, it's a, we need to um, make the bathrooms different. Maybe just have like the restrooms where the door closes, but then have the sinks outside you know, and then just have a unisex restroom. We, we That's what we really need is a unisex restroom. Um, and then we also need, because we we also have to follow the rules for any staff that's breastfeeding. We need to have a breastfeeding bathroom. So that, because that's a state law too. And if right. we have a, a, a staff who's pregnant or, I mean, not pregnant, but um, <laughs> a baby, yeah. And for them to pump or breastfeed the baby if the baby's brought onto campus or whatever, we need that. So a unisex and and that we, we really need to change that around. So with your help, um, you know, maybe we can get those things going and Mr. Carlson and Mr. Deswood could get with um Candace on on those issues. But thank you. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I um I wanted to just during COVID, we we learned a lot too about um, what you're exactly what you were saying. It's preference, right? And we we just want to provide the access. And so with the supplies, we were handing them out, but we learned so much, like how how much um, people needed, you know. And sometimes um, the male students would come or um, even older people, and they would request the um, the supply because um, the other people were at home, right? So they were yeah. not everybody could come, and so we were. And then, um, then I know in the Newcomb area, they found out we were doing that, and then they had family members from other places, and they were like, "Well, can I get them for my cousin or my friend or my girlfriend or whatever?" and so um, there definitely is a need for the products and we're, we're blessed, I think, CCSD to have that program because, I mean, they bring pallets and we go and get them and send them out. So I think, you know, we just, um, just take these recommendations, like you said, and work hard on the balance and, and figure it all out. 
Mm. Yeah, but <clears throat> at the same time, when when we're talking about this, and um, I, I guess I could just pop out and say that you know I don't um, because I don't have a student in in the schools or that yeah I'll go ahead and do it, but um, I'm thinking of those parents mm -hmm. that still. Uh, have the same upbringing as as I did, and and grandparents that said, you know, no, you do it like this, and um, and then when you think about the Kenalda, I don't see the boys participating in that ceremony. I don't see them bringing things to the girl. Um, so, you know, which makes me even more concern and so as we talk about these things it seems like um that transgender they they have more of a say in in this um the way society is now instead of following our traditions and our culture on our own land, on our sovereign land. Um, so I, I I just want to put that out there and say, but you know, in Kinnell, the, the man's place is either the you know keeping the fire going or um to to make the cake or the medicine man. May I have one? Yeah. So for an example, when I was working with the students, we, I had a parent who had five girls and um, they were in junior high and high school. And he was so uneasy about talking to them about their, their menstrual that he came to the health office at that time and asked us to give his daughters a presentation on how to take care of themselves during that time and how to... Um, uh, dispose of and take care of it at home. He he didn't want to have nothing to do with it. And so we did that. And, um, you know, th there's, there's just so many parents today that are single and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so having these um, uh, presentations like that or bringing the, you know, the girls and talking to them um, is, is really needed. Um, but also, um, you know, I have to be careful, careful how I say this, but I honor the, the traditional, the traditional culture part of it. I understand and I'm hearing what, what is being expressed and I, I've heard it myself. Um, but as a state school, we, we're, we're under Title IX where we have to provide these um, these HB um, you know these pro these um, amendments that come out from the state because that's how we get our funding bills. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know I think we just have to incorporate it the best way we can. We can't make everybody happy, but we do have to honor the students' rights. And the 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 Title IX because these come under ORC that could be brought against the district for discrimination um, or a lack of not providing these because the legislation has passed with all of this. Um, you know, I think um, I know the health offices they give presentations. Um, to the students, and sometimes they're separate for the girls, and sometimes they're separate for the boys. But if you bring in a traditional medicine man to talk to the boys about about how they, um, you know, how they see the products, and then how to handle it, and how to react to it, I think that would help um, this part of the the cultural considerations as what Ms. Aspis is talking about. And, you know, and have a parent sign, be involved in that. 
or not, um, because some of them are not um, traditional. And, you know, kids today, they are already watching rated R movies. They're already, you know, they're already doing all the stuff that should only be for adults. They're exposed to it. And I think as, as adults, caretakers, parents, we have to acknowledge that students as young as sixth grade are getting pregnant. They're already advanced. So, um, you know, it, that's a tough thing to swallow and that's a tough thing to hear. But these young kids are already doing things that adults um, should only be doing. Like I said, sixth graders, there's some of them have already had babies. And that's just, and a lot of them, a lot of these kids from sixth, seventh, and eighth grade are in relationships already. And they're 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 already advanced. And so we need to consider that. Also, you know, parents need to consider that. Know your child. Know what your child is doing. And um, I see that Miss Carletta is not agreeing with me, but, um, you know, putting a pad or a tampon in the boy's bathroom is... is well, well, I mean, you're talking about two different cases. I, I don't yeah, yeah, to, no, no, go ahead. Uh, as far as the product is sitting there, yeah. yeah, that's fine. However, once it's used, once it's, you know, if that person decides um, or is not taught the proper way of disposal and just, you know, throws it in there and and then you have a male that comes along and and, and sees that used that's what we're talking about that's what I'm talking about and again I go back to where um OCR you're talking about civil rights so um oh don't think I'm no 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 no, 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 I'm, I'm just bringing up yeah that OCR for one side what about the other side we we forget and that just because we are state funded does not mean that they can go and and to me I don't think it means that they can go and propose and pass a bill on sovereign land which and then when we talk about Yazi Martinez and getting back to our culture and getting back to our traditions and knowing this is part of that. And, and I would say that, um, yes, uh, I agree that some of our youngsters, they, um, there's a lot of things that, that, that uh, a mature, even at our age, even when we were youngsters, that we weren't doing. Um, but, and it's a different society. But, in the time that we're trying to, or we're talking about Yazi Martinez, those are the things that we're trying to bring back to our, our, I hope, to our students and show them that, you know, these traditions, these cultures, these beliefs are there for a reason. Thank you. Oh, um, man. Yes. <clears throat> Um, so even like the even uh, um, even like the wrestling teams, they take a tampon and they open it up and they cut it, cut it, cut it, and then like when they're wrestling and they get a bloody nose, they stuff that part of the tampon up in their nose. So I mean, it's just the way you talk to the kids, but I get I get the cultural part aspect of it, um, and um, you know I. It's the parents. It's the parents' responsibility in the home to teach your child, to teach your son. If you see this, don't, you know, don't freak out. You know, tell somebody, a lady, tell somebody in your school who's a who's a woman to come and take care of that, or tell a custodian. 
the parents have to be responsible in what comes out, what your child understands, because it's all, all we're doing as a school is providing what um, students don't have in their possession because the Kiwi Society that provides these pads and tampons and bras and, pa and underwear, the pads that they provide are the very nice, nice ones that cost like a big box, a big, big box of like 32 or 40 count costs more than like 20 bucks. And those are the types of um, feminine products that this Kiwi Society gives out. They're the the good ones that the that are reliable and the what a female would want to use because it's the top of the line, so to say. So, um, <laughs> but um, because um, so, Miss Carletta is asking about the cost now because some some families can't afford it. Right. Some families can only afford to go to the Dollar General and buy pads that are two dollars, which are the big big bulky ones and don't provide coverage. It, it just goes back to families who cannot provide those essential products or they don't have the money yes. to buy those products. That's where that's what it comes down to. If you have the ability to, to provide, you know, if you have funds that, you know, that you're, you're blessed overly, then that's, it's different. So. But anyway, thank you. I I think you you just at the end there hit the essence of the bill because that's what Mr. Hadamio was saying was that it's a it's a, a lack of access for some people, right? And even um I guess we've been mispronouncing it. We've been saying quick. And anyway, um, so there that's their foundation as well is to provide it to um, the indigenous families because um, it's rural. They may not be able to just run to the store, like you said, and, and grab it. So anyway, that that is the point for it, it was um, access. And then I think um, we have some good notes and some good starting points for the education piece and involving ICO in that educational part as well. So I think this is a good start. Yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's very touchy and, yeah. and, um, and it shouldn't be decided because state is funding us or, I mean, we're, we're supposed to be sovereign and that should mean something. Okay, any other comments, questions, board members? Okay, we'll go on to the next one, permanent cash transfer by Donna Vignazzi. Thank you, good evening, uh, President Aspis, members of the board. Um, Superintendent Carlson. Um, I just wanted to go ahead and let the board know that um, I accidentally sent this permanent crash transfer out by accident. So what I what I usually do with the um, board meetings is we go ahead and put up um, information that we need to discuss with the board or present to the board. And this one is not quite ready yet. So I did let Mr. Carlson know that um, it was my error by sending it to him for approval. So this particular report has numbers on there, but the documentation to support the justification for those um, those uh, numbers are not quite ready by the finance team yet. So this report would have to be um, presented at a later meeting. Okay. Later, like Tuesday? Um, it will probably be Tuesday or either the um, the June meeting.
So you're coming back in June to give this? Um, the team, the finance team would need to go ahead and prepare it and give the report to whomever <laughs> Mr. Carlson designates for this. Okay. Um... So, so we do have the. The number is presented, but um, when I asked the team, like, where's the justification for this and um, information relating to this, they, they're still compiling that information right now. So I didn't want to present the board the numbers without the justification attached to it. But it was my, it was my accident to send this through. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Sharon, what do we do in this case? Oh, uh, we can just go on to the next one. And just like he said, he can probably present that in June or someone in finance who can present it in June. Okay, um, Mr. Yazi, is this gonna affect us on, um, as far as an audit? President Espes, um, so this uh, back in um, 2020, one when we got the um, audit report looked at and reviewed by the um, by the Office of the State Auditor, um, this is one of the um, there was a finding on this. So this is this is our this is this is related to that. So someone does have to come in and they're going to have to use the information from that report along with the um, with what is being reported on the the audit for this past year to 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 come up with these totals. Mm -hmm. So because this is tied also with this year's audit and it's not been um, um, approved by the Office of the State Auditor yet, we can't necessarily disclose some of the information from the from that audit report, but we can from the prior year because that's been already um, posted on the the um, the um, um, state website. So that's why this one needs to be um, waited to be presented so that the finance department can gather information related to it in the current vision system report as well as the, the last two audits. Okay. So uh, Superintendent Carlson or Assistant Deswood? Yes, you might need us both on this one. Go ahead. So on on this one, we do hear it, I guess, because of the embargo that we have. And um, let's find out all the information and make sure that um, our audit person gets that information and so it doesn't we don't have other findings or yes we can do that board I'm president. trying not to talk about <laughs> I, I get what you're saying the audit's not final so we want to make sure we we as Mr. Montoya likes to say mm -hmm. that the I's and cross the T's right right so um So we'll hold this off until June, and I, I hope you make a reminder. And we'll go on to item O, procurement over 60,000 by Donovan Yazi. Thank you, President Aspis, members of the board, Superintendent Carlson. Um, Next thing on the agenda is POs exceeding 60,000 
Um, this is a purchase order for the Empower Educational Consultant Service. Um, it is totally $91,777.25. It is to um, have this company help with um, professional development services um, that it's providing to the district. Um, I believe okay. that's the only one that's on here for POs over 60,000. Okay. On to item P. Accounts payable disbursement, disbursement listing, outstanding check listing, expenditure report, and revenue report by Donna Vignazzi. Thank you, President Aspis, members of the board, Superintendent Carlson. Um, next, we have the um, um, disbursement listing for the operational funds. Um, in this report, the disbursement for the month of April was totaling $5,593,803.10. And for the month of April, for the activity funds distribution list, um, we had funds totaling 31,000, 31, my apologies, $31,099.83. Um, for the operational outstanding check listing, you have totaling five million six hundred sixty-seven thousand eighty-two dollars and thirty-eight cents. The outstanding check listing for the activity totaling thirty-one thousand ninety-nine dollars and eighty-three cents. Our expenditures for general funds for funds 11,000 to 23,000 um, for the month of April. Um, expenditures for totaling Um, expenditures for our grant funds, 24000 to 29000 for the month of April were totaling $1,847,246.77. Now we got expenditures for capital outlay and debt services for the month of April were totaling $7,900,000. $20,192.04. Um, revenues for general funds for funds 11000 to 23000 um, We're totaling $22 million, 80, I'm sorry. Sorry, $22,888,616.70. $8, and I did want to point out as well, too, I believe I did let Mr. Carlson know that if you look at the upper part of the report, there's um, 21 versus $21,445,942.06. Versus the state equalization guarantee, that was, we've, that's, that includes a portion of that impact aid that was, um, I think, due from 1920 school year. I think it was $16.4 million. So that's inclusive of that total there. Um, for revenues coming from grants, um, funds $24,000, $29,000. Um, for last month, they're totaling $482. $1,088.41. Which one is the um, Carl Perkins? Perkins. 
Carl Perkins is on the first page, fund number um, 24174 and 24176. So it looks like there wasn't any funds um, received for that for last month. That's why I wouldn't point those out. Okay. And then you have your um, revenues for capital outlay and debt service funds. Um, for last month, they're totaling um, $50,531.33, which includes ad valorem, school taxes, um, and they are designated there $10,501.76. And the um, SB9 that I believe we were talking about earlier, $35,749.68 for the ad volume taxes there. On that SB9, what, what's the, what's been given? So if we look at the capital improvements, SB9 local 31701, that last line, that ad valorem taxes for school, we got the $35,749.68 is what we got for last month. So this year we received so far $3,051,909.52 so far this year. Oh, okay. And can we go back up to the um, to the first one, the disperse disbursement listing on item two fifty five or two sixty two, page ten. Just asked us, would that be operational or yes, activity? operational. Page 10 and item 262. Okay. Mr. Yazi? Yes, ma'am. Did, did you catch up on that 262? What, what's going on there? Why is it red and and that that amount, 92,000? Uh, present aspect member of the board. So if I look, take a look at it, I'm looking at it and um, just by seeing what it says there, like if we go across to where it says um, item 264, 63, 62, 61, 60, 59, 58. Could you go up, Miss um, Sharon? All the way up where keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay, stop. I go back down. Okay, at the top of the page, if you look at the top of the page, it says right there. Um, I think it's a purchase order number, like to see the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth column where it says 230049. Yes. That's the purchase order number. So all of those charges there are tied all the way down. If you keep going all the way down, tied to this particular transaction. So it looks like to me there, there was probably a purchase order adjustment to this or a check adjustment for this. So you have the same check in black right underneath it on 263. Yeah. 
It looks like it was a check adjustment to charge the right accounts. That's why those are washed there. Because if you look at it, it was charged on page on line 263. There was a total charge for the whole total. So that particular charge needed to be dispersed through all those accounts that are on top or that are prior that are on that are from the beginning of the page. So they have to be charged to each one of those individual accounts that are up there. They have, and be, so that's the way I'm looking at it there. Okay. And the bottom, the bottom four red. Those are those are the same thing. If you lay them back to the, um, it, was, it looks like it's probably a check adjustment there. <laughs> I would have to actually pull the actual purchase order and check number to see what what it, what's going on with that there. It looks like it's just a, uh, it's just an adjustment for the check. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, board members? None from me. <clears throat> we'll go on to item Q, board adjustment and journal entries by Donovan Yazzie. 15100 impact aid operational Q111 T25147 impact aid Indian education 0113 T2902 private direct grants 0114 I Thank you, President. Thank you, President Aspis, members of the board, Superintendent Carlson. So we have here a um, budget adjustment request. It's a transfer bar. Um, this is a transfer bar for fund 51-1000, the impact aid um, um, op um, operational account. So what we're doing is we are transferring funds from the maintenance and repair portion and moving it over to construction service to um, renovate the Judy Nelson um, Little League Field. Mm -hmm. um, the next budget adjustment request is a transfer bar. This is for the impact aid in an education. Um, this is a transfer to clear up the negatives that are found within um, the uh, function of that 1,200 and out, 20 to 2,600. Um, the next thing we have is an increase bar. Um, this is a um, private grant from the Department of Health. Um, the district received $3,500 um, for a peer helper program. Mm -hmm. um, so this is uh, an increase bar to request for budget authority for that particular program. Um, may I ask a question? Superintendent Carlson. Yes, board president. So when we um, take money from impact aid, how is that determined? What do you mean, how is it determined? Who makes the decision to do that? That's the school board makes that decision. So on this, um, by this bar that's already set up, and then we we approve it. Is that how 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 it's done? I guess I would about explain, Mr. Yazi. You want to enlighten us more? 
Yeah, Superintendent Carlson, members um, of the board. I'm sorry, um, President Aspis, Superintendent Carlson, members of the board. So the um, bar that we're presenting, the 15,000 um, is the 75% portion um, that is used for, um, I believe that's used for um, um, capital projects and whatnot. So I think prior to us getting 100% of the impact A dollar, 75% of it went back to the state. So we have to, last year, I believe we got about $22,000 total in impact A dollars. And so whatever we put into the 15, 1000, there is a um, spreadsheet that every time we get impact aid funds, we have to use that, that um, spreadsheet calculation. And then we input the dollar amount that we get from the impact aid funds and that distributes the, the funds into the 75% portion of what we should be spending for um, capital projects and improvements for our buildings and the other 25% can go toward operational funds. So this 51,000 is the portion of funds that we, um, um, that we are required to keep track of. So that's why it's in here, it's used for the, it was originally budgeted for the um, use of the Newcomb schools, um, but since but 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 since we have it sitting there, we had to um, um, use it to um, help with um, you know building projects and stuff like that. So that's what this fifteen one hundred is. That's what I'm getting at. Is that I, I think before the talks were to use impact aid for the schools out in Newcomb, and and then now seeing these come across that that's what i'm asking really the question um are we being mindful are we um keeping that in mind that we're gonna have to pay um for what the, the community wants in their school so that was my question thank you Mr. Yazi. You're welcome, President Aspis. Are we done? Or do you have I one believe, more? I believe that's the last part of this section. Okay. Any other questions, comments, board members? Mm -hmm. Just thank you for the presentation. I'm going to do a a check, <laughs> a roll call check to see how many is really listening. <laughs> if we still have quorum. Oh, really? Yeah. Secretary Wells? I'm here. <laughs> okay, board member Montoya? Still here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we still have quorum. Okay, so we're done. And now we are going into executive session. Number five. Board President Aspis. Um, Sharon, did you want to jump in? And is that other gentleman that still have his report? Oh, the Kirtland, the baseball. Isaiah Valdez? Yes. Duh. I was ready for executive session, but... <laughs> Mr. Valdez, baseball. Do we still have Mr. Valdez? I'm, I'm still here. Oh, oh I am so sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I oh, no. I completely forgot. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so um, thank you guys for having me on. Um, oh, let me see. I refresh my mind. Okay, so we are doing uh, the the baseball team is doing a summer fundraiser, um, with fan cloth. They are through BSN. Uh, they create obviously like gear and material for you know shirts, t-shirts, and whatnot. Um, our softball team used it. And I heard they had great success. And so uh, I want to try to take that opportunity to, uh, 
you know, allow fans outside of our, our school to, um, purchase gear. And, uh, you know, and one thing I like about it, it doesn't just say baseball on it. It just has our KC logo. Um, so like, obviously we have a lot of multi-sport athletes and everything. So if they, you know, have like athletic shorts, t-shirts, it, they can wear that also for other seasons. So, um, the money would go towards some gears. We, you know, we, we have a really nice facility now, thanks to the school district. Um, you know, we got our, our field redone. And one thing that we, we need to get completed would be our big Bubba, which is like a batting cage. And, um, and so right now we don't have wheels for it, a jack for it and netting. And, um, and so what we would like to have is, or try to use this money if we raise enough to put back into our big bubble so that when we drag it um, on the field, we're not tearing up the new dirt and we're not tearing up our grass and it makes our facility, you know, last we, we want to maintain our facility because again, the district has put so much work into it. Um, and, and the big bubble, those wheels alone cost about $150 and we need three of them. And then obviously the netting and, and everything, but really it's for, for the kids to have a, a, a nice mobile batting cage. Um, but also we do have it already. It just needs the upgrades. And I, again, I just do not want to tear up the field. Um, you know, I take a lot of pride in that. I know our school district takes a lot of pride in it and, uh, it really, is just to help the upkeep. Okay. On your, your fan cloth, the logo that you're referring to, um, make sure you get with, um, Mr. Switch to, to, cause we put a lot of work in, um, standardizing the logos the colors correct correct so. yes and, and i would i would more be more willing to get with with uh, mr switch and make sure that everything is good to go mm -hmm. um and obviously with fan cloth they send over the mock-ups and then i usually get them approved before we we actually go with it mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments, board members? No. Okay. Thank you. Oh, awesome. I, I really Thank do you. apologize. I, I didn't, I totally forgot. Nope, nope, not a problem. Uh, it was going to be a late night anyway, so. So don't worry about it. I appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now we'll go on to five executive session. So do we clear the room first or do I go ahead and read? I think you have to read it. Yeah, I am. I, 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 but I read it first. Convene in the executive session to discuss limited personnel meeting matters regarding personnel matters update as permitted under NMSA. 1978, Section 10, 15, 1H2 of the New Mexico Open Meetings Act. Somewhere in there says clear the room. <laughs> I make a motion to convene an executive session. I second it. <laughs> Have a good night. Thank you for absolutely yeah, staying. Yeah. <laughs> Are we gonna take a vote? Yeah, yeah hold on. Uh yes, okay. Yes. 
Okay, Cheryl votes yes. And Secretary Wells. Yes. And Board Member Montoya. Yes. And I vote yes. Four zero.
Is it still being fixed? Yes, he's still. Oh, we're not live yet? No. You guys were, are really little, so I'm watching you guys. How's okay. the face? <laughs> oh, okay, now? Yes. Okay. okay, reconvene in open session as stated that the board has discussed in the executive session only the subject identified in the agenda as the reason for which the meeting was closed. Discussed limited personnel matters regarding personnel matters update as permitted under NMSA 1978 section 10, 15, 1, H2 of the New Mexico Open Meetings Act. And a motion to reconvene. Motion to reconvene. Second. I second. Oh. Feature to it, asking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Secretary Wells? Yes. Uh, Vice President Husky? Yes. Board Member Montoya? Yes. Board Member George? Yes. And I vote yes. Those in the Petri dish. <laughs> so <laughs> we're on to the item six items for the May 16th regular school board meeting. And I say no. <laughs> Go ahead. We'll start with uh, Vice President Haskey. Um, I would like to go over what's allowed to be worn. I was asked about regalia, things that are not um, more traditional, culturally appropriate to wear during graduation. Um, so if we can cover the do's and don'ts in regards to what can be worn. And then also, as a reminder, um, I think we were going to cover safety and what that entails, how that's going to look during graduation. They, they, they kind of already did. Oh, okay. This earlier this, this evening. Oh, sorry. Okay, then strike that. So it'd be just the other one. Yes. And that's what I can think of right now. Okay. Uh, Secretary Wells? Uh, I think we need to discuss uh, I would I would like, first of all, to uh, hear an update on the sprinkler system in the, our warehouse. And I think we need to uh, um, extend our superintendent a um, contract. Okay, is that, are you done? Yes, that's all I have. Okay, board member George. <clears throat> um, can we get a report of, of the safety data sheet <clears throat> and chemical inventory um, that we have, that we use, and... Update on the on eyewash sinks and showers in the district. And then update on the hepatitis um, shots that the district should provide for um, like the health staff or SPED or anybody that's really custodians who clean up the, the bodily fluid.
That's it. Okay, board member Montoya. I have nothing at this time. Can I add something else? Yes, go ahead. I'd like to know what the status is in regards to um, finding a vendor in regards to assessing our uh, SPED services. Where we're at on that and if we haven't progressed, why and what next steps so far. And did we also cover earlier, I'm not sure, did we cover um, handicap accessibility and so forth for graduation? Mm, no, not, not, no. For, I, I would like to cover that. The, um, for wheelchairs, handicap accessibility, uh, for elders, um, what, how that's going to look in the schools. During graduation. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so did you get those, uh, Sharon? Yes, I did, Board President, thank you. Okay, so I don't have anything <clears throat> other than the, uh, the updates, the running updates on the lighting, the signage, Um, hopefully that's done by then. Board President. Go ahead. On the lighting, like I said earlier in our, me our meeting today, our meeting won't be until the 22nd, so not, okay. not much will change on the, on Tuesday. Just FYI. Okay. So, um, just say that on the 27th. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm, you got it. Okay. So, I'm trying to think. I, I know there's one more item then. Um, We're going to do an overview or, or of the uh, bond and SB9 issues. Is, is that what you wanted to say? Yes. Yes, um, for Tuesday, and um, and we we all need to come to a point where we all understand it, um, because as I said, I think it's important that we not just um, go put it up for vote, and we know it's going to pass. But so the people that it really falls upon um, are the very ones that are are going to be hurt financially. So we need to make sure that we understand that. So SB nine. May okay. I ask a question? Go ahead. Um. Jermaine, today, I know what it was. Uh, the governor said that there was a match um, for schools, school, old schools, and the match. Mm -hmm. And she, she signed a recent legislation to change that so that most schools can get new facilities. Can you look into that? Or I, I think that was... President, no, yeah. I, I, that's, um, 
we talked about that bill in the, the last meeting. And essentially what that bill did was reduce by 30% the match requirement for schools. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, okay. But we can definitely circle back on that. Candace and I can be prepared to it, yeah. it if you want us to. Okay. Just... Perfect. Because there's some things she brought up today. No, and I'm I. She was discussing it, and she said that it had changed some things. So yeah, if we could just because it also has questions. that five year average issue, um, Vice President. That's concerning to us. So we'll need to mm -hmm. participate in the rulemaking on that because that that is concerning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some things that were coming up today, and the the. The afternoon when I listened, and I just have to remember because that just can't that just popped in my head. So I'll remember the other stuff. So I so appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Oh, wait, I have two more if may. Okay. Um, hold on. Okay. Um, can we uh, bring up the whether or not because um, uh, Navajo Nation lifted the health order for mask mandates, um, but it they said it's up to each school um, school district to decide if they want to enforce the mask um, requirement or not. So we need to discuss that and then um, take this open up the um, work sessions on Navajo Nation right here, because it's open now. What do you mean? Um, we can have in-person meetings here in Shiprock and there's no mask mandate. Okay. The mask mandate's been lifted. Uh, Superintendent Carlson, can you get somebody to find out on those? Sure. Do you, do you mean somebody to come in and talk about them or just to do you want whoever's to have supposed to Whoever's supposed to um, keep on top of the mandates of Navajo well, Nation. Right. I can, I can have somebody come in and give that. I mean, because the the what was put out by the Navajo Nation is pretty explicit and it basically just says that mask mandate is no mask are no longer required um, and that they're meant they're up to people how they want to deal with it. But I can have somebody present. We have our COVID people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then um superintendent, you need to decide if you're gonna require still require the mask or if you're going to just leave it up to the parents if they want to send their kids to school with a mask or not. So we're we're going to go ahead and, and go right along with the Navajo Nation. Um, it, it's perfectly allowable, but it's not required. Okay. So, a motion to adjourn. Motion. motion. To adjourn. I second. <laughs> <laughs> that was everybody. <laughs> Get that Sharon. And second. Who second? I second. Okay. I second it. And roll call. A husky. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, Secretary Wells? Yes. Board Member George? Yes. Board Member Montoya? Of course. And I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. Have a good night. Good night. You all be safe. Hey, did everybody check out the Daily Times? Oh, no. There's a